Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the 2021 PTV User Group Meeting, UGM. As you can see, it's a rather dreary and wet morning today. We were hoping to give you a better view and a background of the Singapore Flyer, but alas, maybe in the afternoon, the weather will clear. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kelvin Ng. I'm the BD Manager for PTV at Asia Pacific Office, and very happy and very excited to join you today. So we've got a huge agenda of events, lots of different speakers and topics. So we hope you can stay with us for as much as possible throughout the day and join us for all the interesting topics and information. <coughs> well, without further ado, let me introduce our man of the hour, our managing director for Singapore office and vice president for Asia Pacific, David Go. Let me speak a few words. Uh, David has over 17 years of experience across consulting, general management, venture building, mobility, smart cities, and innovation. As you can see, wide portfolio, lots of experience. I'm very excited to introduce and welcome him today and let him take this event to Dave, please. Thank you. Also, Kevin. Just my slides. Good. Right, thanks a lot, Kelvin. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to PDD Asia Pacific User Group meeting right here in Singapore for 2021. If you'd like to welcome our loyal customers, partners, academics, transport operators, city, state, federal government representations from Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Myanmar, Australia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China. We have lined up a series of great content this year, exactly what Kelvin mentioned. And for that, I would like to also show my greatest appreciation to all our guest speakers today. Lecturer Park Rahana Pasha from University of Garamada, Kamel Rudolph of Bosch, Von Lopez from Rambo, Miss Lipei from CBG, who will share very interesting use cases on multimodality in Siam and demand responsive transit in Vietnam, bus passengers' behavior, EV bus planning, and also a topic on air quality where Sustainability admission is so much more addressed right now in different cities across the world. PDV, a well-trusted brand for the last 40 years and many, many years to go, uh, many, many years forward as well, by over 2,000 cities across the world. So our customers, be it, whether it's government agencies, consultancies, research institutions, or even schools, academic, where we sit and sow for the next generation of aspiring engineers have trusted us to deliver the best insights for them to make the best decision for their cities. This solution have penetrated in a very wide geography uh, across the world, particularly for Asia Pacific, we are across uh, 15 different locations, all thanks to our loyal customers and our trusted partner network. Maybe one news that I would like to share with all fellow uh, PDV loyalists, uh, lot loyalists and also friends as well. Uh, about a month back, uh, we made an announcement that a PTV group has, which was originally fully owned by Porsche Holding, currently we have a new majority investor. Fishpoint, a private equity firm uh, headquarters in the UK, and made a uh, massive portfolio, uh, with a massive portfolio globally, uh, has taken over 60% of PTV group share. So what that means is PTV is well positioned for growth in the coming years, both organically and inorganically. So PDV having a really very strong software routes, you'll see more additions across a wider value chain for both mobility and transportation in the coming year. So we hope that uh, this will bring more confidence to our partners, our users, our customers, and most importantly, the city government, local government uh, that trust us for the last 40 years. And we will want to bring the best to the table. So without further ado, let me bring forth uh, the technical director, uh, Gopi, and also our social specialist, uh, Hong, to share with you what are the new features, new functionality that we have for Vision 2022. Uh, this helps you uh, get a head start and also get you ready for 2022. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day with us. Thanks, Dave. Good morning, welcome to PTV Singapore User Group Meeting 2022. So I'm Gobi Gopal. Here I'm going I'm going to provide what's new, what's new 
na for Vizum na 2022. So let me start my na presentation. So for Vizum 2022, there are a lot of na there are na few imp na improvement and new features has been introduced. So the improvement or uh, the, the new features are categorized into three. Okay, first more detail. Okay, the second group is sustainable, and the third group is faster, and additional and more uh, small improvement has been has been done to the existing Vizum functionalities. So when it comes to more detail, okay, where we better support modeling which goes beyond the standard application Vizum. So under sustainability, uh, under sustainability, we introduce features that better support application in the area of sustainable transport planning, and for faster, we improve some of the core assignment methods from which many users will benefit, and also we like to tell you about other changes, update, improvement in various areas, finishing off with some rather technical changes which you should be aware of. So let me start with more detail. Under more detail, more detail in Vizum 2022 refer to application with junction modeling and activity-based demand modeling. First, before I start for multi-resolution modeling, first I have a question for you. Can you uh, tell which of the two screenshot, okay, on the left, and uh, on the left and on the right, okay, which one is Vizum and which one is Vizum? It's quite so. From what you guys can see. Now uh, that both screenshots are, are quite similar. Okay. Let me, sorry. the one on the left is Vizum and the one on the right is Vizim. So in support of especially multi-resolution modeling, the geometry view of the junction editor has, has, has undergone a huge change. The display geometry is much closer to the representation of in Vizim. Reducing surprise and the effort for correction when models are transferred from Vizum to Vizim. The representation follows more and more the idea what you see in Vizum is what you get in Vizim. Here again, as a reminder, the geometry view in Vizum 2021 with rather schematic representation of a node. And in contrast, in 2022, the new view with a better representation, with a better representation of the node or the road network. And this is how I made a small video. This is how the new junction editor in 2020 looks like. So what you see here, okay, so this is how, you know, like if you change to junction editor, so you'll be able to see detail, junction detail, detail of lane configuration and the turning movement, okay, it's, it's the same as in 2021 where you're able to select on the attribute, it get highlighted on the view. In addition, the foundation was laid for interactive, therefore, faster editing of geometry in the junction editor, like crosswalk, focal length. Nodes can be moved with the mouse. The course of links can be edited. The discrepancy can be quickly corrected based on the background map that is displayed. Yep. Then this is what the, the new improvement made in the multi-resolution modeling section so now we move to agent based modeling which made a, a significant uh, improvement as well and introduced a new method so for high definition agent based modeling quantum leap for demand modeling the new visual abm means quantum leap for demand modeling especially for more choice modeling we extended our last abm into two dimension okay spatially and temporarily resolution you could call it now high definition ABM. I think I, I don't want to go more uh, to explain more detail in ABM in general. You know that ABM is about the mobility of individual instead of macroscopic person group. Key, a key feature of a new implementation is the 
spatial resolution. For mode choice, we use shortest path between two nodes instead of average zone to zone travel time. For example, which mode is the correct one from one zone to the other? In a, in a macroscopic model, this is not clear at all. The disaggregated, however, show a clear picture. It based on a concrete address. In this case, so in this case, a car may be a preferred mode, while here a scooter could be used. Then the second method temporarily uh, resolution. The second extension of VZoom ABM is a temporary resolution. Instead of 24, instead of a 24 average, the ABM used scheme from a several scheme time slice. A 24 scheme may look like this. The choice would be probably the car. However, the morning peak may be congested anyway, invisible for the 24 hours assignment. The car, in this situation, the car would probably not be the preferred choice. Possibly, bicycle or PT are the favored alternative. Then again, uh, conclusion for high definition agent based modeling. It's user friendly. Example is ready to use. No scripting necessary. Parallelization has been done. Then we jump to next group, which is sustainability. So under sustainability, it includes features that address modeling of measure and all modes to reduce environmental impact of traffic. As we all know, many cities are looking for a solution to tackle congestion and the increasing environmental impact associated with it. With the objective to establish sustainable changes, Various measures are being introduced, are to be tested as part of the future scenario. And this is the current scenario uh, tested as part of the congestion and environmental impact. This includes driving bans, forbidden through traffic, charging policy depending on pollutant emission. For example, low emission zone falls into this category of measure. They have been introduced or they are planned in many cities. So as part of these new features, modeling area with excess restriction. The type of restriction that we can model in Vizum 2022, through traffic prohibition, driving bans, area two. What's the benefit? Easy to model, combining different type of restricted traffic area, easy integration in scenario management, available in static and simulation-based assignment. Again, for these features, I put together a small video So let's say, for example, here we want, try, we want to model restricted traffic area, example, forbidden through traffic. How to model? It's easy. Just select restricted traffic area function, then create a, uh, a boundary, what normally you do for zone or territory. So once completed, then go to the list attribute of, okay, then choose which type of restriction that you want to implementing the model, then select, you know, which transport system are relevant to the restriction. Then after that, go to the uh, impedance definition. Okay, done. Uh, okay, then run the model. Run, sorry, run the assignment. Once the assignment completed, then you can filter out, okay, you can set a filter for links to evaluate result using the flow bundle, internal origin, so internal origin and destination traffic distribution. How you know like it looks like post implementation of the restriction. Yeah, here it shows flow bundle. Again, I don't. Uh, don't want to go too detailed to flow bundle that you can create a flow bundle to look at a pattern, the post implementation traffic distribution pattern. So let's move to the next topic. 
public transport assignment under sustainability improvement. In the area of public transport assignment, there's a, there's also an innovation that is unique in Visum to the best of our knowledge, set us apart from other software providers. In Visum 2022, the timetable timetable based assignment has been extended. Now it can take services into account for which headways but not timetable are specified. There are various use cases in which this combination is more suitable than using existing methods with a timetable or headway only. A typical use case are, a re, if you look at a regional model where you have a, on a one side supply that operates at close headways, like metro lines in the central area. On the other side, regional supply that operates according to a timetable. So in planning phase, you might know the demand and so the, the needed supply like headway, but you don't want to pick a specific departure time. Not to assume good or bad connection, with this extension, you can have a both information level in your network. The next one is bicycle assignment. There has been a request by our existing users in, in the Asia PAC region, you know, to have a dedicated bicycle assignment. So PTV has listened and now incorporated a dedicated bicycle assignment into Visum. So this not only refer to the forecasting ability to the demand side, also include the assignment of bike demand in contrast to motorized private transport. Cyclists behave differently, we all know. So volume capacity ratio hardly play a role. Cyclists do not only aim at minimizing travel time, criteria such as distance, the attractiveness of route, but also safety and comfort are factor, factors for route choice. In addition, preference among cyclists differ Therefore, different routes are chosen between two zones. To better account for this aspect, a dedicated bicycle assignment, which I mentioned, has been introduced. So as part of this bicycle assignment, the nature of the bicycle assignment is stochastic assignment, considers specific of behavior of cyclists. Impedance doesn't, does not depend on volume. Okay, the, the last group is faster. Okay, let's go into the, uh, what the improvement has been made under this category. The main improvement is the fast, the you know, improvement in you know, order to speed up the highway assignment. Okay. The assignment that's been um, in, uh, improved is statistic private assignment, classical equilibrium. Okay. Based on what we look at the usage of tracking data, the classical equilibrium assignment is the most used assignment method in Visum. So, it has been modernized now. It's now the fastest equilibrium assignment ever. Massive speed up, okay. What we have done is we have tested in a, a test model. Okay, We use a German wide validate model with over 20,000 traffic zone and more than 5 million links. Okay. The outcome of the testing is it achieved gap of 10th of in uh, less than an hour. In the previous release, this took hours. The massive speed can be can be seen over a, a whole range of model, also can on a standard machine. The second private assignment, which has been improved in terms of speed, by Kongjat, Frank Wolf, BF, the BFW, the main improvement is memory reduction. So we all know BF. W has been introduced in Visum 17. For huge models, memory has been limiting factor and was slowing down the runtime. Now this has been addressed, okay? And maybe more importantly, okay, as part of the improvement, proportionality has been introduced in this method. So without previously, without proportionality, there are equilibrium solution where vehicles are of different rel relation and transport system are not equally distributed over alternative. That's what you see here. We have a blue car for one relation and red car for another. Without proportionality, the blue car used the upper section and the red car used the section below. Now with introduction of the proportionality, the blue car and red car are equally distributed over two alternatives. That is a desire in particular when post-processing assignment result, for example, matrix estimation flow bundle analysis. 
So now let's go more. Okay, what are the other improvement or new features that have been introduced? Here the list, live location search, SBA improvement, redesign signal data, right, uh, right sharing updates, matrix usability improvement, interface updates. So for live location search, it's similar to how you go to the Google map and look, type in a location that it, it straight goes to the XY uh, location that you uh, intend to see in, on the map. So now in VZoom, okay, you're able to do this. You type the location, then it then VZoom automatically takes to the exact location on the map. The next one, simulation-based assignment is an improvement. Okay, what are the improvement has been uh, made in simulation-based assignment? The first one is improve lane change at a complex intersection. Let me run this video so that I can explain. So with this improvement, vehicle do not do any unnecessary lane changes when approaching the node. They are already on a lane that either allows them to change to the next focal lane or they can exit from that lane to the next lane. So it's all depend on the location of vehicle on which lane for them for their intended direction. Okay, the next improvement under SBA is look at distance for lane selection. Here we look at an example where vehicles travel from A to D. From A to D. According to the current behavior, they can use both lanes when entering link A to B, but must change to right lane in B. So with the improvement, okay, below is the behavior with a look at the distance. The look at a distance is defined for link A to B and corresponding to the red rectangle. So it includes node C as well. So it can change the, the lane ahead of before they turn right. Consequently, vehicle already consider at node A that they must, they must exit link B to C from the right lane. Therefore, in this example, all vehicles travel on the right lane on a link A to B. So it's similar to Vizim, okay? The, the range of locate distance is greater than zero, that uh, less than the link length of B and C. The third improvement is SBA merge penalty. In 2022, we introduced a node attribute that enables calibration of capacity downstream of mergers. The attribute defines an additional time gap for vehicle that enter the same destination link from different incoming lanes where you can define uh, a value a penalty value for different nodes to mix to to model as a realistic merge behavior in your model Then another improvement on signal data mo uh, model. So as most of the uh, VZoom user, you may, be, you may be aware that VZoom supported different type of signal coding, namely internal signal, okay, like we have a differentiate between stage-based, signal group-based, and basic. Each of these type has an advantage and limitation. Therefore, they were used in a different kind of project. So PTV main objective was to unify unify these three options into one, have one data model for signal data. For user that has con uh, consequence of that signal coding can be later be extended when the model is applied for in other project. At the same time, we want to get rid of signalization type external. So signal data are part of VZoom version. So now, so the, the VZIC data model does provide the ba best basis, but also has some disadvantage. 
that we wanted to address in this project too. These are the listed some of the improvements that have made. The motivation, as I said, no more external signal signalization types, unification of data model, avoid need to switch between different types, improvement in visit, enable coding of simple control, enable undo as well, integration of SIG file, enable integration in scenario management. So now again in 2022, when you read a version file prior Visum 2022, 2022, the signal data are converted automatically. If you do have an older version, when you use when you open the model in Visum 2022, it automatically uh, convert for for the user. If you add a SIG file, they are no longer needed once you save the version in Visum 2022. So we also introduced a new attribute called signal program data, the essential holds all data of signal control. The attribute also save in text file, where you can edit in text file, and more importantly, it used when the signal data are transferred to VZ. For, for signal data, there is still the possibility to export and import the .sig file. This can be useful for exchange with the external program. In VZoom, you can now define daily signal program for calendar space. Also, we have integrated a signal view from VZIC that also shows phase transition for stage-based program. That is for the signal control. Then the next improvement is matrix usability improvement. For matrix usability improvement, even though it's a small improvement, more into the kind of like rename, view, matrix editor, matrix histogram, matrix comparison, filter automatically switched on when you define condition, matrix editor, under matrix editor, switch on filter, change marked area, then matrix histogram where you can switch filter, matrix comparison, same, you can switch filter that previously that you have to go back and forth to do all this process. Now, this has been simplified to make it easy for the user. Then, regard, then regarding technical topics, there are some important changes that I like to inform the, the users. So then Python environment as well. So the important cha changes, discontinuation of lossy assignment. Under this discontinuation, no more bug fixes. It will be removed in two years time. Tribute lossy assignment is not affected. Reading older Visum file, where reading of version file safe in release version before Visum 11.03 cannot be read in Visum 2022. Same applies to other binary files like graphic parameters, layout parameters, reading of older text file, setting for language and add-ons, moved. This has been moved from license dialog to user preference. For Python environment, the support for Python 2 has ended. Now, then Python 3 update to version 3.5, update several Python libraries plus added libraries like Dask, update of add-ins delivered with Visum, update of .vai of user add-ins required. Before I, before I end my Visum 2022 update. These are the, uh, the small improvement included in Visum 2022, like pseudo dynamic volumes, background map, Tyler, stop point analysis, new attribute in scenario management, copy definition of UDA from one version to another, copy procedure from one version to another, 
improved and faster shorter fast search outside assignment, line breaks in column aiding of list, demand time series based on time interval sets, and many relations. So with this, I end my presentation on the Wisdom 2022 update. Of course, in this the time allocated, I've covered you know all the key topics. We also from PTV Singapore, we are happy to engage with all the participants. If you are interested in a specific topic, please contact us so that we can have a separate session after the UGM to explain more in detail how it works. If that's all from my side, thank you. So now I pass to my colleague, Hao Min, to provide an update on VZIM and VSWOC 2022. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hope you are able to see my screen. Um, let me just change the view a little bit. All right, um, very nice to see all of you. Good morning and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are today. And uh, very nice to see some of the familiar names in the attendees list and hope you are enjoying it so far. So from my side, I will be presenting on the new features of PTV Vizim Viswalk, which is our vehicle and pedestrian simulation platforms. Um, maybe addressing my PTV colleagues, uh, Summer and Akmal, if any time I'm breaking off, maybe the bandwidth is too much and then I can maybe switch off the video. So just uh, unmute and then just let me know straight away. So there's no lag there. All right. Um, Great, so now continuing on with the uh, Vizim and Viswalk 2022 feature update. An overview of what we will be talking about. It will be first the vehicle simulation improvements and then the handling and visualization improvements and then on to Viswalk specific, which is the pedestrian simulation platform. Of course, when we talk about uh, Vizim, Viswalk and pedestrian simulation, the handling and visualization is also improved inside the pedestrian simulation platform as well. So do take note of that. And then for public transport, it is the combination of our vehicle simulation and pedestrian simulation improvements, and then some other small improvements that we will also talk about. Um, before I continue further, feel free to put in your question into the question box, and then we can address it later as well. Okay, um, going into vehicle simulation, we'll be talking about the new emission calculation, which is an integration with the Bosch platform, which is the Bosch um, Environmental Sensitive Traffic Management platform. And then on towards our mesoscopic uh, simulation platform, which is the improvement of merging and lane selection. So this goes in hand with what Gobi has presented on Visum SBA. So similarly in Visum Mezu, there are these two improvements there too. And then for reverse parking, which is very, very popular in Asia, uh, this is currently under construction, but will be in future service pack for Vizim 2022. Okay, so let's dive in into the Bosch ESTM. So previously with emission calculation, um, the previous solution was based on Enviver. And this was a separate program and you are not able to see the results inside Vizim. But then with a new solution, which is the Bosch platform, there is the usage directly inside Vizim and then the results will be directly inside the link and network evaluation. So you don't have to have a different platform to do post-processing to look into the results, but directly you are able to see inside the Vizim platform itself. So more into the details, um, so how does it work? First, you need to prepare the model inside Vizim. So there is a new emission class distribution and currently there are already 182 predefined classes from HBEFR, which is uh, based on the European um, conditions, European uh, predefined standards, right? But of course in Asia, when we, if we have a different standard, please feel free to let us know. And then we will also communicate this with Bosch and then see the possibility to have this predefined inside Vizim as well. So once you prepare the model to 
set up the emission class distribution, then you assign this distribution to each vehicle type, and then you run the evaluation. And when you run the simulation, there is the automatic upload into the Bosch Cloud Platform. And then from there, we are able to directly download into the Vizim platform for visualization and results directly in Vizim. So some details of this um, for the emission calculation, which is how the calculation method is, which is based on the single vehicle trajectory. And then there is the average vehicle per emission class. So the indicators are carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, hydrocarbon, particle mass fuel consumption. So these are the typical emission indicators that, yeah, it's um, looking into air quality improvements and changes. And how the evaluation looks like is how you are able to see inside this picture, which is the direct network performance. And then in the picture shown, it is the link segment results. So you are able to see that over at the junction, because there is much more start and stop, so then the emission over here is much higher compared to, let's say, in between the junctions and then when, P when the vehicles are just moving along. Some limitations, sorry, um, before that, uh, the prerequisite is that you need to have the add-on module for Bosch emission and, of course, the internet connection to connect to the Bosch uh, cloud platform. And the limitation is that du during modeling, you will have to have this sort of code start um, outside your calculated area because then you are then able to have them already a warm start before going into the uh, study area where you're interested in. So a code start is needed, let's say, a longer link before um, the study area to go in before they get into the warm uh, calculation emission, and then you're able to more accurately simulate the uh, air quality results directly inside VISM. And some HBFR classes are currently still missing, like the LPG and hybrid and moped vehicles. And then currently um, the output is not in the vehicle record, but then um, it will be under the network performance and link segment. So more information, we had a webinar in July 2021. Um, please feel free to go into our webinar list and then there are much, much more information as well. But of course, during our afternoon session, there will be the Bosch representative and also our VZIM product management representative um, to talk more about this emission. So stay tuned for that. All right. Um, let me just show you directly within VISIM how it looks like so that you are able to see um, more clearly and then have a more I like better idea of how it looks like. So there's a new tab, Emissions, and you need to tick for Bosch Emission Calculation Active. And then under Base Data Distribution, as mentioned, there is a new uh, distribution called Emission Class. And over here, as you can see, there are different different countries like Switzerland, Germany, Austria, predefined HBEFR sort of uh, uh, categories. And then from there, you're able to change directly the different shares based on the different emission vehicle, emission vehicle class, and then emission stage and the fuel type as well. So able to do also even though with the predefined ones some different configuration so that you are able to better represent your study area and once that is done once you have defined the emission class distribution you are then able to go to the vehicle type and then if you click on it, there is also a new attribute called emission class distribution. And this is where you then define what you have set up in the emission class distribution, link it to your vehicle type inside your study area. And once that is done, when you run it as mentioned, and then you push it onto the cloud platform at Bosch, and then after that, you're able to directly download the results. And what you can see is that the vehicle network performance evaluation result, you're able to get the air quality output for the different, um, let's say, different elements. And then for each link as well, you're able to have the emission output. So as mentioned before, here you can see that at the start and stop area, there are a lot more um, 
emission output um, compared to just the direct links where vehicles are just moving without stopping. Okay, so that was the Bosch emission and then hope you stay tuned as mentioned for the session this afternoon to go into more details about this. And moving on to meso simulation, similar to what Gobi has mentioned in Visum SBA, there is a time loss due to merging penalty. So right now you're able to calibrate the capacity drop at merging areas, which is more realistic because at this particular lane on the left, without the merging area, let's say the rule of thumb uh, typical capacity will be 2000 vehicles per hour. But when there is this merging lane coming into the right lane, typically the capacity will be less than 2000. So how do we model that? Is then now with the X value, which is the meso penalty and applies to vehicles which enter the same lane and come from different lanes and links to model properly and more realistically this merging penalty. The next improvement for meso simulation is that you are able to have a more realistic lane change distance. So as we, as how we drive, if let's say I'm coming in from here and I want to enter the roundabout and exit over here, typically I will actually, let's say, do a lane change earlier, right? So in micro simulation in Vizim, this is done by the lane change distance. So for Mezzo, in our previous um, previous versions, what happens is that it goes over here, still sticking to the right lane, and then only at the last note before having to do the lane change, then it does a switch. But right now, there is an improvement where you are able to as well um, apply the lane change distance. And even though it your lane change distance from this particular lane change ends here, they are able to, your, your vehicles are able to do the lane change basically up at the upstream node, which is over here, and it makes it more realistic. So instead of um, doing the lane change distance too late, it does a lane change distance earlier, which is more realistic to what we have, uh, what how we drive realistically as well. And on to reverse parking, as mentioned, this is currently under construction, but it will come um, at the next service packs um, in Visim 2022, so stay tuned. And previously, how we did this in Visim will be via some trick modeling, like using COM and using certain things like stop line, et cetera. Um, and then what we will want to do is then you first signal for turn and then stop just past the parking space over here. And then you back up into the space using the side mirrors to view line. So that is how we typically do reverse parking, let's say safely. Um, and then how the new attributes are in Vizim will be this new values for parking lot attribute, which is parking direction. So there will be a new um, attribute called reverse forward and also another called any opposite. And there will be connector, which you will have to set attribute reverse parking and then can only be used during driving in reverse. And of course, there are the new route attributes as well, which is calculated automatically and then for multiple routes to same parking lot. So since um, Visim 2020, uh, we are able to comf comfortably uh, create car parks and then the routing and let's say the internal um, priority rules, so on and so forth with the car park creator. So as tuning to this, the reverse parking will also be created comfortably within the car park creator. So no worries about that. It will be, let's say, a smooth uh, creation and easy transition to be able to model this. Okay, so that was the specific uh, vehicle simulation site for Vizim. Now we go on to visualization. So now for Vizim 2022, there is a new creation for scatter plots which is the, yeah, let's say a little bit of the result uh, visualization. And then also the addition of web map services where you are able to input um, customizable URL uh, that is, let's say from your different customizable maps um, that's online right now. And then for video recording, there are new codecs and then alternative camera movement and some direction indicator for stop lines. So going into the details, um, 
for scatter plots, we are able now to have the attribute X over attribute Y. You are able to, let's say, um, yeah, have the different network object type um, for the output, and then define what is on the x-axis, what is on the y-axis, and then which data series it belongs to. What is really cool is that you are able to then also specify the different time intervals and also do some filtering and aggregation. So instead of uh, having to output the result into, let's say, Tableau or Power BI, of course, over there, the data visualization um, tools like specific are more let's say versatile, but then at least you're able to do a quick post-processing directly within Vizim with the scatter plots as well. And for web map services, this was already included in Vizum. Now we are including this in Vizim, where you're able to input the URL for, let's say, customizable maps. And license, do not license cannot be provided by default with Vizim, but free usage can be possible depending on project. And you are to take note that the of the license conditions of different, let's say, web map providers that you are using inside your current uh, Vizim platform. And for video recordings, previously we are only able to record AVI uh, output from Vizim, but right now we are able to have the different available co codecs for uncompressed, let's say, and then MP4. Um, MPEG4 as well. And then right now, the restriction of file, files above 4 gigabyte has been lifted, and now it is possible. And for the video recording, the alternative camera movement, for previous versions, what happens is that when it transitions from frame to frame, let's say I want to focus on this particular building right here, but when it transitions to another view, it kind of takes away this central point and then on, it then transitions into this current one. But with the new feature, what happens is new improvement, let's say what happens is this, that it will keep centraling around your model around the center point. So this will, let's say, make it nicer for your video output, especially now you can have the different codecs. And then with this, um, you're able to really have a really beautiful video recording from your simulation. And for the visualization, uh, there is the 3D network editor is now available to have a wider range. So before this, we are able to have a eight kilometer radius view distance, but then right now there will be about 20 kilometer where you're able to see further and you're able to see the static 3D model further as well. And for the other part, which is the level of detail. So in Vizim 2021, there was no transition between level of detail, whereas currently there is the improvement of the transition between the level of details. And what was mentioned, which was the direction indicator for stop line, because previously you will have to, if you click on um, a, a certain signal head or priority rule, you'll have to see, okay, uh, the link direction. But right now, there are these, like, let's say, bigger arrows that you're able to see directly which direction it is uh, like facing and which direction it is uh, affecting. So a better uh, visualization um, when you are doing your modeling. And moving on to handling, there is improvement in attribute decisions and attribute modifications. And also there is the location search directly for the geocoding. And for license management, also just want to point out some simplified steps as well. For improvement in attribute decisions and attribute modifications. So attribute decisions was introduced uh, since Vizim 11. And now and previously, of course, it is still location based where you are you have to say that okay, when a vehicle or a pedestrian step on a certain place, then they are affected by this attribute decision. But previously it is a bit limited where there is no filtering, there is no formula, but based on let's say distribution or constant value. But right now we are making it a little bit more like how the attribute modification is, which is we added the filtering and formula function for attribute decision and for attribute modifications. This was basically um, introduced in Vizim Viswalk 2021. And this was to take 
scripting away from, let's say, having to go into external Python, but certain things you are able to do directly within Vizim. And then this, there's improvement for this, which is the addition of the distribution attribute. And yeah, so I mean, to just to point out, there are still some limitations with scripting within Vizim environment altogether, because let's say um, if I want to generate pedestrians or vehicles at an XYZ value, there are these things where you are still needed, Python is still needed, or let's say COM interface is still needed uh, to communicate with Vizim and Viswalk to be, to be able to do this. Just take note of this. And what is unchanged between attribute decision and attribute modification is that attribute decision is still defined by location in the model, let's say on a link or an, or an area example. And then attribute modification, you don't have to define it in a certain part of your uh, model, but then it is just defined by time. And for location search on background map, um, this similar to Vizum, you're able to directly zoom in. Let me see. Uh, let me see if I can do, just go directly within Vizim 2022 and then show you. Uh, let me know if you are not able to see my screen. So this is how it looks like when you open Vizim 2022 or let's say Vizim. What happens is you are at a scale of 2000 kilometer, which is way too far. And previously, you're, you're having to zoom in by scrolling your mouse or create a link or area to directly zoom in. But right now, there is this small button here, which is the location search. And for example, in Singapore, I live in Tiong Bahru, so I would just put this neighborhood. And then once I click it, it goes directly zoomed in. And as you can see, the scale from hundreds of kilometers dials down into 500 meters. And of course, we have the different map providers directly within Vizim, where you can have, let's say, different views and of the background map. Yeah. So let me go back to the slideshow. All right. And then for the next one, for there is this license management where you're able to do directly within the license management, the activation, update, deactivation of licenses without going into the web depot. But of course, the web depot is still there. If you are more comfortable to use it, please feel free. But just to also mention that this is a much easier way to do these functionalities and then also for borrowing of licenses and cloud licenses are easier and available. And other than Vizim Viswalk help, there is also the online help pages specifically for license management right now. And then this goes through, let's say, the different uh, the different things of how to do activation, update, et cetera, using license management or other methods. And also for you to do certain different like activation, like offline activation as well. So please take note of that uh, for this improvement for your easier uh, connection to our software. So we finished the vehicle simulation and then the handling and visualization. As mentioned, handling and vis visualization will also be the improvement in the Viswalk production simulation platform. So do take note of that. And then for specifically improvement of production simulation, this is where we will go through these different parts, which is some improvement to the data model for straight stairs with multiple landings. So previously there were already improvement and then this is further uh, additions as well. And for network editor, you are able to edit objects during multi-selection at a route location. And then going to simulation, there is the new pedestrian attribute and then evaluation and importing of shape files as well. Okay, so for the straight stairs with multiple landings, you are able to have the different geometry, which is, let's say, having the straight with two landings or straight with three landings instead of last time uh, having to create an area, for example, or and then a RAM, an area and a RAM. Right now, you are able to just directly change the shape under this geometry section. And for the next part, which is the multi-selection, previously, you will have to um, let's say click on one and then move it, click on one, move it. But then right now you're able to do the multi-selection and then move, move everything to, as well. 
and then you are able to more sim more easier to add a route location on area to multiple routes so previously you're having to do one by one but right now there is this part where you're able to change for all the routing so to maybe describe it better i will also open up a uh, vism as well i hope you can see my screen so what happens here is that pedestrians come in here and then they are routed to the location over here. And just to show you how it looks like originally before I do anything, um, yeah, so they are wanting to go to their destination via the gates. Just a very simple model. And over here, if you can see, I added this triangular area where I specified a dwell time there. And let's say I want to say that, okay, all pedestrians should dwell here for, let's say, a few seconds. So what I do here is then I click on this particular route and then open the context menu. There is something called add route point for all partial routes. So if you click on that, you are able to have this different, let's say, selections at first routing point after the routing decision, which is here, at last routing point before the routing destination, which is in the middle, which is actually what we want, as new route destination. So example, I just want to show you, let's say, um, if I have a new destination for all of these pedestrians, I can just click on this, and then let's say click on somewhere else where you have a different area. But as mentioned, what we want to do is, which is the middle part as last routing point before the route destination, and if I click here, all pedestrians will be routed to this triangular area. And when I run the simulation, this is what they do. So easier handling, easier uh, editing for in, this, in, in the pedestrian simulation part. So going back into the slideshow, for this part, um, there is this, as mentioned, the new editable attribute dwell time for pedestrians. So over here, um, if you haven't used attribute modification, do um, try to go into it, experiment a little bit. It's quite interesting. So what happens is that when I, when I create an attribute modification here, I say that the object type is pedestrians in network and the target attribute is their dwell time. So meaning that their dwell time changes based on certain formula certain filters that I input. And the object filter here is that the name is Vladimir and the name is Estrogen. Of course, this is not inbuilt uh, Vizim attributes, but we have the user defined attributes where you're able to do this. So as you can see here, Vladimir and Estrogen are here. And then it says that the, in the formula, it says that if uh, this area and their name and based on this filter, and their name for stage, if go dot is here, their dwell, their dwell time becomes zero. If not, their dwell time remains. So when go dot comes in, as you can see, they then leave. So this is, yeah, let's say a much simpler way to uh, create formulas without having to go externally via the com interface. Depends what you feel more comfortable with, but this is quite interesting to use. And um, yeah, this is the added attribute for pedestrians, which is dwell time. And now there is a new evaluation output, which is number of stops and time spent being stopped. And as you can see here, it is within the network performance evaluation and also the area output as well. And what is defined as not like a stop time uh, or let's say what is defined as a pedestrian being stopped is let's say when they are walking with less than 0 0.2 meter per second. Then this will be added in the um, output simulation for the network performance. And the next part will be the import of shapefiles where polygon type shapefiles can be now imported as areas or obstacles. So you are able to, other than import BIM, import CAT file, able to use street file to import directly as areas or obstacles. So moving on to public transport, which is the mixture of the vehicle and pedestrian simulation, there is the improvement of terminal stations and then the door assignment for the boarding alighting passengers and then distribution of waiting passengers and formula-based line selection. 
So let's go into the details. For the train reversal, let's say at the terminal station, previously we will have to do, let's say some trick modeling as well for um, dummy links or um, using COM to make them turn onto, let's say the overlapping uh, link for the other direction. But right now, there is the new attribute called change of di driving direction for line stops. Once you activate that, you are able to also with uh, place a link in opposite direction, and then they are able to directly use the opposite direction to exit um, the area, exit the terminal station. So the conditions is to place a link in opposite direction. And now there is an improvement when you create a link in Vizim, open up the context menu and then just say, uh, place a link in the opposite direction overlap, then straight away uh, you have this link without having to manually draw it. And then to, you do that and then activate this change of driving direction, create partial PC line downstream of the turning to route the line, and then you're able to enable this functionality. There is an example um, for this train reversal using these new features already. And yeah, uh, feel free to let, like if you cannot find it, just uh, feel free to reach out to us. And for distribution of passengers waiting to board along a platform, let's say, for example, the entry is over here. And typically, pedestrians are not so willing to, let's say, move so far down the platform. And previously, we are able to, let's say, do the uh, boarding passenger where they are able to be uniform across all doors or, let's say, at the front or at the end. But with this distribution of distance, you are able to let, yeah, uh, model more accurately the behavior of pedestrians that actually it is a distance distribution, but not so de deterministically as before, but more of a distribution right now. And then for formula-based line selection, previously there you are able to, let's say, um, use the attribute of relative volume to say that, okay, line selection, what is the ratio going, uh, like boarding the particular train. But if you think about it, sometimes if it's not uh, MRT, but a very long, very long distance trains and very long distance uh, platforms, um, and there are multiple trains coming from different lines at a go uh, in, let's say, within 20, 30 minutes. And you want to assign that, okay, for your, let's say, rate pedestrians, they are off a certain destination going into a, further place, then they will board a certain line. So this now is enabled. Instead of relative volume, you are able to use formula to de define the pedestrians boarding based on their individual pedestrian attribute. So this is, let's say, a simpler way to, and a more accurate way to um, model pedestrians that are transiting, model pedestrians that are going to different locations, and then uh, model pedestrians uh, for the, yeah, for let's say the different train lines as well. And for the refined distribution of alighting passengers on doors, so certain, certain parts as well, let's say for alighting, we previously have this uh, distribution called, let's say, uniform or at the front, at the end, for example, or in the center. But right now you're able to define for per door a certain distribution that say that, okay, at this particular part, because the driver is here. So typically pedestrians do not, or let's say less pedestrians are coming out from this door. So then you're able to define under this new um, attributes, passenger without, yeah, let's say passenger front and then passenger rear. So you're able to go for each of the door um, this uh, different attribute. And then if you put it above zero, uh, typically then there will be less um, a lighting distribution for these trains, for these particular doors. So that was for the um, public transport, which is the uh, combination of uh, vehicle and pedestrian simulation. Before I end, just want to mention some other new features, the smaller ones, which is the improvement of drug limitation that can now be switched off, example for let's say cable cars. And you are able to cancel writing results after simulation to save more time. 
especially if let's say your evaluation output is a big bunch and there is the dialogue renewal for distributions and functions. Sorry, I took this from my, uh, I stole this slide from my um, Chinese colleague, so it's, uh, it's in Mandarin. But as you can see over here previously in our previous versions, this is for cars and then the distribution for the um, acceleration deceleration function. Then right now, the new outlook will be the, let's say a better poly, better line and better visualization co compared to this. And the other um, improvement is that, or let's say update is that Python 2.7 will no longer be supported with Vizim Viswalk 2022, only Python 3.9 is supported. So please take note of that when you're using COM. And you're now able to output PDF as background image. And for the smaller improvements, which is to filter empty cells in lists, and then improvements for open drive import, improvement for multi-selection edit, editing, and also faster zoom. So that is all the update that we wanted to bring to you. And see you next time with uh, PTV VSIM VSWALK 2023. As usual, always keep us updated. Keep telling us which features are lacking. And yeah, always have this uh, open communication with us about certain things that don't work well, certain things that work well, and we look forward to your feedback for these new features of 2022. And I hand over back to my colleagues. Um, thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the afternoon session. Uh, you can see the weather is a lot nicer. Uh, we've got a wonderful backdrop and hopefully we can see the Singapore skyline and the flyer now. So again, thank you so much for joining us for the afternoon session. We've got, I believe, six different topics and speakers today. So a uh, very jam-packed afternoon all the way for the next three hours. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box at any point in time. Uh, we will try our very best to answer it, but if not, we'll always reply via email. Let me introduce the next moderator and host for the upcoming session. Uh, Ching Man is our, uh, sorry, Mr. Tam Ching Man is our BD Director for PTV Asia Pacific. He has over 20 years of experience building relationships, driving revenue growth, and designing sustainable cities and the future of mobility. Ching Man is also a very avid cyclist and a champion for active and uh, personal mobility in Singapore. So I believe this is a topic that's also very close to his heart. At this point in time, I'll turn over to Ching Man and the speakers. And again, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to raise your hands or type it into the uh, questions and chat box. We will do our very best to answer all the questions. Over to you, Jingman. Our first, our first uh, presenter will be Ms. Lee Peiyu from CPG. And she's a, currently a principal transport engineer at CPG. And uh, she has about more than eight years of experience and she has worked on several projects in China as well as Singapore. Uh, she was recently awarded the ACES Young Consulting Engineer of the Year Award uh, 2021. Congrats. And uh, her topic for today is sharing our experience in developing multimodal Zoom model. And that will be from Xiamen in China. So over to you, uh, Pei. Thank you, Chairman. So good afternoon to all of you. Uh, maybe it's good morning for some of you as well. Um, I actually, I'm Li Peiyu. You can call me Li. I'm currently working in CPG Consultant. And today, our topic will be sharing our experience in developing multi-model Zoom model. So in this presentation, we'll be sharing this experience using the PTV Zoom software, Zoom 2020, to develop a multi-model transport model for Xiamen, Malan Wan Island City in China. And because this is just a very short presentation, if uh, you would like to find out more about the project or the software itself, you may actually contact us separately after the presentation. Okay, so uh, as a start, I'll give a short introduction about myself, my company, and some of the services we are providing, followed by um, the project background of Xiaowen Wanwanwan Island City detailed planning before we dive into the multi-model modeling for this project. And then I'll end off with some of the future opportunities we can actually explore together and then open to the floor for Q&A. 
Okay, so some introduction about myself. I'm Pei Yu, and you may call me Li. La. Okay, I'm actually currently a principal transportation engineer in CPG. And um, I have actually been in this company ever since I graduated. And I have the opportunity to actually participate in several large scale projects, uh, be it overseas or in Singapore, like uh, ER467, Dali Integrated Transport Planning, as well as Singapore Changi Airport Air Site Simulation Study. Okay, so what is my company about? CPG Corporation. As um, those who are familiar with Singapore history, uh, CPG was once uh, from Public Works Department, the department that actually designed, built, and planned Singapore in the early days. And after that, we were actually corporate, uh, we were privatized, become CPG Corporation, and currently we are under China Construction Technology Consulting Firm, which is also known as CCTC. And under CPG Corporation, that is an umbrella of um, companies. And uh, I'm actually currently in CPG Consultant, which is a multidisciplinary design consultants. And we are actually currently based in Singapore. Our key market is Singapore, but we also do projects all over the world. As I mentioned, we are multidiscipline consultant. So we cover services from architectural design, civil and structural engineering, and most importantly, transportation engineering. And these are the six core services which uh, we actually provide as a transport division. One is a multimodal transportation modeling, integrated land use transport planning, transport impact assessment, also known as TIA, road alignment and traffic engineering, construction traffic planning and management. And lastly, we do research into the future mobility planning. So these are some of the key projects we are involved in Singapore. Uh, the master plan studies for Bongo Digital District, Jurong Innovation District, as well as the TIA study for our project Jewel. We also go into Asia Pacific, like in Thailand, Philippines, UAE, and even Iran. And here are some of the key projects we are involved in China, uh, Kunshan, Chengdu, Tianjin, Dali, and also Xiamen. So this brings us to our project reference of the day, Xiamen Malanwan New District Central Island Detailed Planning. So uh, what is the background of this project? It was initially a design competition and we actually went in with a local design firm, which is a Hodo Design Group, and we won this competition. And this project was awarded to us and we furthered the plan with the local government. So where is this Xiamen Malanwan New District? Okay, this figure actually shows the outline of Xiamen. And this Malawan News District is located where the yellow highlighted portion is. And where is this island city? It is actually the centroid, the center of this news district. And it will serve as a core, be it function-wise, service-wise, as well as it is a central business district, a CBD area for this new district. Okay. And we have a few key visions for that, where we look into the internal, the exterior, the core, and the people-centric function of this island. In this project, we actually work closely with the planners, the designers, as well as the local authorities to develop this master plan. And we look into the design brief, direction, land use plan, development quantum, as well as the targeted population and employment within this island. What about the transport network? For transport network, we're also looking to three main portion, the vehicular road network, the public transport network, as well as the non-motorized transport network. For this project, for the public transport network, we actually dive down into some of the services like the public bus, urban light rail transit, and mass rapid transit. Whereas for the non-motorized transport, we are looking into three uh, walkways along three different levels, which is underground, at grade, and elevated. And for the demand-wise, this project actually studies the typical weekday AM peak, and we are, will be adopting the four-step transport model. Okay. So how does a typical highway model looks like? In this Zoom, we can create zones to represent each land plots and set the links to illustrate the, um, the vehicular road network. 
and the output they gave will be the number of private car trips along the major corridor and also the average uh, volume capacity ratio, also known as V over C ratios, and the average travel speed along the major corridor. Then what about typical public transport model? On top of what we have in the highway model, we can actually set the uh, public transport stops along the links and also to create and set the uh, public transport lines to illustrate the services that we have planned for the city. And the output that we will obtain, same thing, we will have the public transport tr trips along the major corridor, as well as the volume capacity ratio of each services or each public transport lines. That brings us to what about multimodal modeling? Multimodal modeling will be, for our case, will be an integration of these three different models, highway, public transport, and non-motorized. For non-motorized, this project, we are also looking only for walking only and cycling only. So how does this translate into Visum? It will look something like this in terms of the network model. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of lines that represent the different laneways for the vehicular roads or the pedestrian laneways at different levels. So it looks very complicated. And this brings us to highlighting some of the key challenges we have when we develop a network model for a multi-model model. So first thing, like shown earlier, it will give us a complicated layout with a lot of links overlapping each other. Next will be the pedestrian connectivity between different levels. Um, because this is this zoom is different from the scene where we can look into um, different layers in detail. So they, are, they actually bring some challenges to us when we look in detail on the vertical connectivity. And we also look into the integration of public transport and non-motorized networks. So for the complicated layout, in this project, what we did is we make full use of the Visum uh, functions with the filters and the graphic display adjustments, where we can clearly um, break them into layers and illustrate the links that we will want to see. So for instance, in the first figure, it actually shows the links for the vehicle road, and the subsequent ones will be showing the pedestrian linkways at different levels, be it the at grid level, elevator level, or underground level. Next will be the pedestrian vehicular, uh, pedestrian vertical connectivity. How can we showcase the benefits of safe and seamless connectivity along the underground and elevator walkway? So when we first run the model, it actually shows that the pedestrian tends to congregate along specific routes and we observe very minimum pedestrian movements across the levels. So is it the way we model it wrong or how can we make it more accurate? So what we actually did is we further break down the link ways into different types and categorize them based on their level. So you can see in this table, what we did is we break them into very detail instead of generalizing them as non-motorized transport link. So we have uh, a grid level one walkway, and then it's vertical connectivity, same thing we did for basements, as well as elevated levels. And what we did is for each link type that is meant for different levels, we can also set the transport system meant for it. For instance, in this project, we are not allowing cyclists to go to the basement level. So we did not include them in the transport system meant for the basement linkways. Then as for the travel speed along these corridors, walking and cycling have very distinctive um, travel speed. So by separating them, we can actually set it appropriately. And when the assessment runs, the model findings will be more realistic. And to further um, illustrate the benefits of the uh, underpass as well as elevated walkway, what we also did in this project was that we set a no impedance at the at-grade level to illustrate and simulate the at-grade pedestrian crossing, to illustrate the delays they may face when they are crossing these roads. Okay, and the next one I will talk about will be the, um, the challenges we face when we integrate public transport as well as a non-motorized network together. 
So some brief background on the public transport stop hierarchy. Okay, there were in this zone, there is actually a stop, stop area, and a stop point. So basically, in uh, for example, in the MRT station, in the train station, stop point is the point where you have your alighting and boarding happens. And then stop area can be the platform of the train line. And lastly, the stop will just generalize the entire train station as a stop. Okay, so in a typical public transport model, what we usually do is we connect this public transport stop to the zone centroid using the connectors. And from there, the um, transit activity as well as the first mile, last mile of the pu public transport trips will be generalized and captured outside of the links. So by doing so, how can we measure or assess the first mile, last mile connectivity as well as a public transit activity? And what we do, what we did in this project was that uh, we actually modeled the public transport stop individually. We allocate a uh, one stop point, one stop area and one stop for each public transport stops. Okay, and then we connect them to the development zones not just using the connectors, but also the non-motorized links. So from this figure, you can see, we, we can actually, uh, from the model output, we can see the, the pedestrian movements, be it uh, public transport walk movements or walk only, cycle only movements, it can be captured on the non-motorized links before it leads to the zones. And this gives us a more comprehensive assessment of the PUT trips where we consider the transit activity as well as a first mile and last mile trips. And then now we move on to the demand model. Same thing for the network model. What we did was to combine all the demand model for each travel modes, be it a private car, a public transport, walk only, cycle only. So we actually faces two key challenges when we are doing this. One is the demand model for the non-motorized transport, and next is the assignment method. So let me go into detail on this. For the demand model, we initially started the model by adding one new demand model onto the highway model, which is the non-motorized transport model. It's meant to illustrate the traits of uh, pure walking and pure cycling. And by doing so, we are unable to distinguish the traffic flow for walking only and cycling only. And then uh, because it's actually grouped as one demand model, we are also unable to distinguish and set the different travel speed for these two types of travel. And lastly, uh, like I mentioned earlier, in this project, we do not wish to have cycling to be on the underground walkways, but because they are grouped together with walking as one of the um, demand model, we are also unable to separate them. Okay, so what we did next is we split them into two distinct more demand model, walk only and cycle only. And by doing so, we are able to set the transport system and the travel speed on each link type properly, like what I've shown in the previous slides. And then through this, after the, the Zoom has run out the assignment, we are, we are able to identify the key cycling corridors or key walking corridors, as you can see in the figure below. This actually illustrates the number of cycle trips at the at grade level. Okay. Then next I move on to the next challenge we have, the assignment method. I believe most of us faces this same question. Which assignment method suits the non-motorized transport the best? I believe that um, the figure here you can see PTV Visum actually provides us uh, choices, quite a number of choices for assignment. So should, which one should we choose? And even after we have choose a specific assignment method, what are the parameters to be adjusted and how can we adjust this? So initially in this study, we started off with equilibrium assignment, which is similar to what we usually use for a private car, a highway assignment. And this actually resulted in a congregation of pedestrian movements. I believe this is mainly due to um, this actually assigned based on shortest path. So all the cyclists and all the pedestrians, they will choose the same path. And like I mentioned earlier, we also didn't observe um, 
any movements between the different levels. So it may not be as realistic as what we observe on real life, in real life. So what we did next is we switched to stochastic assignment as per advice by PTV. And it actually shows that number one motorized routes are more spread out. As you can see in this slide, the figure on the left shows the number of cycle trips at a grade level using the equilibrium assignment, while the one on the right shows the one um, using the stochastic assignment. As you can see in the figure on the left, by having the equilibrium assignment, some of the routes is clearly um, have high traffic, uh, high pedestrian and cyclist movements, whereas the adjacent ones are empty. Okay, and uh, in real life, when a cyclist or pedestrians see the, um, the walkway in front is congested, they can easily go to the adjacent walkways or they can try other routes, right? So this was actually not reflected in this first model. But while we do the stochastic assignment, we can see clearly some of the routes, they are more evenly distributed. Pedestrians and cyclists are actually directed or dif distributed along the different walkways within the same area. Okay, and we have actually broadly validated with the past Siamen statistics and the one that we actually obtained using the stochastic assignment is more well aligned with the past data. Okay, so in general, we found that the multi-model modeling gives a more comprehensive and holistic findings, especially on the non-motorized transport and the public transport trips, especially in the findings for the journey time and distance. Okay, and these are these are the figures that we usually um we usually extract from a PTV Visu model. So in general, with a multi-model model, besides having what we have the V over C ratio graph, as well as the um the, the capacity, sitting capacity of a different public transport lines, we can also obtain the number of uh, active mobility trips along the different corridors as well as the travel time isochromes for these active mobility trips. And um, this brings us to what is the benefit of this multi-model modeling? We feel that um, for planning work, it actually helps to facilitate the planning decision for certain infrastructures. For, is, for instance, in this project, this actually helps our client to decide, should we build and plan for a ULT system, a MRT system, or the public bus services is sufficient enough. As for the active mobility network, do we need an underground walkway, an elevated walkway, or the aggregate ones will do? So this actually gives our client some justifications when they make the decision. And as for the planners wise, the multi-model model findings actually helps them in their active mobility network planning, as well as designing for the interchange facilities. And this brings me to what are the future opportunities we can explore together with PTV and other industry players. I think for what we are lacking now is more on the interactions between the all travel modes within this model. And uh, like I mentioned, the traffic assignment for non-motorized transport. Uh, we are just um, using what was given at the moment, but like what Gopi has actually shared earlier this morning, the updates with the latest PTV um, Zoom software, we can actually explore more functions for this traffic assignment. And lastly, the flexibility of the non-motorized transport routes. As more and more cities going into car light and focusing into the people-centric function of the cities, we are exploring and designing more shared spaces, shared corridors, even developments. We are looking into gateless developments. So these are some things that we feel that we can further explore in the future. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. And I'll now actually open to the floor for any questions. I think this is very heartening to know that uh, you know, master planners like, like CPG and other companies are really looking into um, multimodal and active mobility. You know, I mean, not too long ago, it was very car centric. Right. Hmm. Um, so, so it's very good that, that that you guys are using the Zoom for for this very big overall picture. Um, I've got a question for you. So, um, how is this? 
how is this Xiamen example relevant to the current bus around 15 minute cities like what Paris and Singapore is aspiring to do? Okay, I think uh, we understand this 15 minute city as a new uh, residential urban concept in which uh, we target to have most of our trips accomplished either by walking, cycling within 15 minutes. I think even for Singapore Transport Master Plan 2040 targets, we also aim for this whereby we actually uh, would like to see 9 in 10 people getting to their nearest neighbourhood centre or amenities through walk cycle rides in less than 20 minutes. So through this multi-model, this Zoom model that is developed in this project, I think we can not only assess the travel time of the private car trips during the peak hour, we can also assess the travel time, the active mobility trips, like your walk, cycle and ride. And then through these model findings, we can advise the planners uh, on the land use plan, as well as the transport system and the network that's required to achieve this outcome. Yeah, I hope this answers your question. It's a good answer. <laughs> okay, so another question, and this comes from Taufik. Uh, hmm. Do you each network? Do you build each network for each uh, public transport, private transport, and and uh, an MT? I think what he's trying oh, to say. Sorry. Do you sorry. each network separately? Okay, I, I believe um, this question is actually asking, uh, do we build the, individ the individual network for each trans uh, transport system, is it? Yeah. Uh, yes. So um, basically in this project, or like most other projects as well, um, when the, the master planners or the urban planners, they will develop a land use plan and the um, broad skeleton on how the road network will be like. So using this as a reference, we will develop the different networks in VISO, in PTV VISO, uh, by drawing the links and actually uh, creating zones that actually symbolizes their land plots. Thanks, Pei. Okay, final, final question from us. Um, I guess. You, have, you have shown various outputs, like the, uh, the model findings from VZoom. Um, how mm. have these visuals helped in working with the urban planning and urban designing team? What can other industry players benefit from this multimodal model? Okay. Uh, okay. For this, uh, actually, from the just now the figures that I showed, right, they have different outputs that we have obtained from. I think one of the key ones will be the number of trips along the major corridors, be it the private car trips public transport services, as well as the active mobility trips. From these numbers, we can identify the key corridors, okay? And for the planners wise, they will know that which road is congested, or do they need another road or another type of transport system to support um, the traffic, the transport movements, okay? And we also do shows the travel time isochromes. It actually helps the planners to actually see visually, even from the figure itself, they can see from this plan, are they able to achieve their target? Like for in Singapore, we have tried to target that people can complete their trips within 15 minutes or 45 minutes. So from the, from the findings, we can see whether can we achieve this. If not, then we have to further refine the plan. As for your second part of the question, I believe it's asking about how can this also benefit other industry players. So uh, for this, uh, what I can think of is that uh, I do heard about this beneficial to other industry area players like the, uh, the real estate. I mean, by knowing that which corridor have the high uh, footfall, they can actually plan or put in uh, retails along this corridor to ensure that they have more returns. And I also heard from uh, advertiser where by knowing, know, by knowing which corridor have the high footfall, same thing, they can plan for those eye-catching uh, billboards or advertisement along this corridor to actually attract more people and also bring up their business. Yeah. Great. I Great. hope this so, answers your questions. <laughs> so, so the science, the science of uh, really using modeling and simulation actually helps and collaborates with other industry players and and people yes. can visualize the, the, the benefits of actually doing models and not just a 
plain traffic consultant job. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Pei. So um, we, we we ran out of time. So thanks, thanks for okay. your presentation. We'll go to the next Okay, question. thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and now I'll pass on to uh, back to you, Chaman. Thank you. Hi guys, so that was a very, very interesting uh, topic by PE uh, and CPG. I think it's uh, really, really, really different from how how things are being uh, addressed now in terms of master planning. Not too long ago, it was really, really car centric. Now, now it's multimodal and active mobility and, and people. Uh, all these, all these actually point towards sustainable transport and what we what we talk about carbon emissions and car light and all that. So let's uh, invite Mr. Kenichi Koichi from Nippon Koei, and he will be presenting together with Mr. Gobi Gopal. Uh, Gobi is our, I think most of you would have met him. Uh, he's, he's our PTB technical director, and he's, he, he's very popular amongst, I think, I, think, I think most of you know him. So yeah, he's distinctive. Uh, Facial beard. <laughs> okay. Um, he will be the he will be the moderator afterwards. So uh, I think I don't need to really introduce him. He will talk more about himself later. Uh, but more importantly, is actually our our user, which is Mr. Kenichi Koichi. Uh, Koichi-san uh, studied civil engineering in Tokyo. Uh, he's a professional engineer and he's uh, based in Japan, the headquarters of uh, Nippon Koei in Japan. And uh, they will be presenting. They'll be co-presenting this part about the evaluation of demand responsive transport services as a future feeder service between a major mixed development and a proposed MRT corridor using Zoom. All right, over to you, uh, Gobi and Kochi-san. Uh, thank you, Chema. Gobi-san, can I start from me? Yeah, you can start. Yeah, so good afternoon. So uh, I'm really glad to have this opportunity. I'm Kenji Kochi from Nippon Koei in Japan. So uh, now we have made a uh, uh, close relationship with PTB Asia Pacific for the, our further business development. So today we introduced a case study. It is uh, uh, actually our self-funded study to prove the potential of the PTB software for mass planning or impact assessment. Or mass measures. So next, please. The Gobi san. Oh, okay. So here's the agenda. So firstly, I will introduce our company and the potential of the collaboration with the PTB Asia Pacific. So and uh, I will talk about the overview of this study. Then I will switch to Gobi san from PTB. He will explain the uh, modeling and evaluation part. So uh, next, please. Uh, uh, yes, so this is an overview of Nippon Koei uh, business. So Nippon Koei is a civil engineering consulting firm in Japan. So as a business areas, we have on, not only consulting sectors, but also energy sector and uh, urban spatial development sector. So we uh, usually provide full range of project management services uh, uh, from the concept and the investigation to operation and maintenance as a uh, technical trustful trustable uh, partners so oh, next please ah, so oh, we have the project globally so oh, i uh, myself is working in the this uh, the transportation and a special area and the area uh, i'm in charge of is uh, Japan the Asian cities so around here so oh, next please uh, yes so this uh, now Nippon Koei and PTB Asia Pacific are talking about business development based on our MOU uh, this is a current picture and uh, target customer as a uh, set as a smart city uh, development and management entity uh, such as uh, local government communities uh, real estate uh, property developers and transportation operators so uh, along with the business uh, business cycle like strategy and design management uh, implementation and operation maintenance so uh, we are going to provide uh, the end-to-end -end solution uh, from planning consulting to the 
uh, operation and post delivery. So, uh, and we will uh, realize overall involvement as a strategic partner in the transportation planning and city planning uh, with PTB solutions and also local partners. So, uh, but tentatively, the direction or vision of the, uh, our collaboration is necessary. So, capturing entire smart city mobility value chain in a, a integrated land use and mobility development. So, under this uh, statement, so as a strategy, we consider the smart mobility as one of the the uh, pillar of smart city offering and the integrated value chain approach and sustainable business case and uh, uh, grow uh, strategically with client using repeatable models. Uh, uh, th this is shown in the figure in, on the right hand side. So in this figure, uh, to collect the input data from local platformer, then the visualization, the simulation, and the scenario analysis are conducted using PTV software, and then uh, we'll provide planning and design project management uh, uh, services will be offered. And we are pursuing the repeatable and cost-effective model of them. So next, please. And I move on to the overview of the case study. So next page, please. So the purpose of the, this study is to analyze the effective and business feasibility of several potential transportation services based on mass approach through uh, traffic simulation to the area uh, along the MRT corridor, which is under development. So, and uh, to confirm the effectiveness of traffic simulation in mass planning, uh, the target area is set uh, by thinking of the uh, like uh, typical uh, urban development in Southeast Asia. So newly development residential complex along with the uh, MRT corridor, which is uh, located uh, around 10 or 20 kilometers away from the downtown of the capital city, uh, is set in this uh, study as a target. So next, please. And we raised the uh, mass scenarios possibly evaluated uh, by traffic modeling. So planning of MRT access transportation and planning uh, of micro mobility in complex area uh, like uh, uh, cycling on the foot and the mode of choice of, of downtown access transport, uh, not only private car, but also direct bus or MRT access. And uh, the impact of impact of the uh, subscription services for public transport. So from them, we selected the evaluation of the demand response transport services as this case study. So next, please. Uh, this is a uh, uh, member involved in this study. So uh, this is one of our business development activities and the PTB he, he conducted the business modeling and evaluation and uh, Fenica Mass, the company, the, the, who are the local mass company, so provide us the, the result of the web inquiry via uh, their application bus map. So for the information of people movement. So this overview of the study. So that's all from my side. So Gobi-san, uh, could you uh, continue? Okay. Thank you, Coach san Okay, I'm Gobi here. I'll just take, uh, continue with the presentation. I'll more focus on how you know, we have conducted a visual modeling for the case study. So let me start with PTV vision for mass planning. Just an overview. Okay. PTV vision, why PTV vision for mass planning? Because we emphasize on an holistic approach to urban mobility, delivers powerful insight to bridge the gap between cities, consumer, and transportation network providers for mobility mix of, of the future that is safe, sustainable, and efficient, and gives concrete forecast and calculates exact scenario and business solution based on real-time precise model. You know, the user, the specific performance indicator, user know today that how to design a future-ready mobility concept. This is an overview. So let me quickly take you through the, the methodology and the result of the study. So it's an uh, appeal that this is the, the POC study area. We need to blur it because there's some confidential 
confidential uh, matters. It is an, as what Kuruchi San uh, mentioned, is a newly developed mixed residential complex along with the Ho Chi Minh City MRT, which is under construction. Okay. So as part of the modeling, we have collected land use data. There is limitation in the data availability. So my team and Kuruchi San team, we put a good uh, effort to collect what's available on the, on the publicly on the net, okay. So status of the land use data update into Resume, resume model. Land use data, okay, by planning uh, boundary adopted from Ho Chi Minh planning website, then aggregate the, uh, the ward population into Resume traffic zone. Then the next step, we have identified and aggregated, I'm sorry, uh, four main categories, industrial, school, tertiary, and office. So these data are used for to establish the baseline traffic generation calculation. Then move to the, the, the supply model, the supply uh, model side. We have established traffic zone, 21 internal zones with the seven external zones, then create, then develop a traffic connectors. The, the reason is the area is quite uh, small compared to the, the wider area. Then for the road network, we have I did, uh, defined link type, number of lanes, speed, lane capacity, truck time restriction within the study area. We also added public transport information uh, again from, from the data provider bus map. We use the data to define public transport stop and routes plus the, uh, the timetable for the bus, the existing bus route. So for external zones, as I mentioned, we have identified, you know, the external zone which is the cordon zone. So representing the, the part of area which is not model, okay. The main issue when, when, when we come to this, identifying the external zone, the land use and demography data, plus the travel distance and time represent, representing each coverage area. So the, the size of external zone is quite big for the focus area that we are looking at. But somehow we have used, we have come up with a, a method, you know, like we have identified and we think this is sufficient, you know, to showcase uh, the P, uh, B zoom modeling for the DRT. Then for the intrazonal, the, what you can see, the one on the left is the internal zone and the one on the right is the external zone. So the, the matrix above okay, represent the ratio of external to external zone trip through the study area. Then the, this matrix is multiplied by the final matrix generated by the demand modeling to be assigned on the road networks. For the demand modeling method, as most of you know, okay, uh, when we look at the demand model glance, demand model available in Visum, in Visum, like four step, you know, EVA two based demand model. In case we use a standard four step, in fact, our transport demand is created where the needs can cannot be fulfilled in a zone, so demand is generated from any O to reach the D. The magnitude, the magnitude of attraction and production is highly depending on the demographical and land use data of each zone. The generated transport demand is distributed by a gravity model where the likelihood of attraction depends on both utility nearest zone having the desired characteristic and the weight of each zone. So for the future year scenario, okay, the zone has been uh, expanded. Okay, we have collected the future year land use data and then incorporated for the forecasting. Added future private and public transport supply network into the model. So now let's go for you know look at the the, the ride sharing scenario. 
as part of the, the, the scenario testing, for the future year, we have combined the DIT and the metro system are integrated, service area, high growth area, area including zone, these are the zone 11, 7, and 5, uh, represent this part. The metro corridor assumed to serve zone 1000 and 1003. The DR, okay, the, another assumption is the DRT demand is composed of 30% switch from the car travel demand in the service area. As part of DRT modeling, Pudo and Olding area were created in Rizum. Let me uh, show you the one, the yellow triangle is the Pudo area. The one, the red is the Olding area. As This is a part of the setup that we need to uh, define in Rizum. So again, I like to uh, emphasize, assuming that 30% of car trips are switched to DRT demand, like various oper operation strategy can be evaluated by changing some attribute and design element like holding area, Pudo, fleet size, passenger capacity of vehicles, engine type. If let's say we're we looking at DRT in the EV, in the electric or conventional, acceptable waiting times and acceptable detour distance. So the next slide, I'll go more detail on the parameters. So as what you can see on my screen, the Pudo and Olding area were created in Visum. The one that the green dot and a synthetic uh, trip generation by Visum. The parameters that, that the user need to define are the holding areas, Pudo, acceptable wait, wait, waiting times and acceptable detour. So the assumption that we use for, for holding area, if a vehicle is not called for 10 minutes or more, it drives to a holding area predefined. For Pudo, as, yeah, it's a pickup and drop-off location. Acceptable waiting times, acceptable period of passenger to wait until they are dispatched. Acceptable detour, the bigger this value is, the more efficient is the DIT from the operational point of view and less attractive for user. And then for the future year, we established, you know, the, the DIT flow. As you clearly uh, see that, you know, the DIT flow from the from the development, you know, the 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 flows are or the trips are dispatched, okay, now between each pudo established along the MRT corridor. Then what we have done is we have done a, a scenario comparison and analysis. So each scenario contains a structure of model build and procedure sequence which allow user explore and test vary comparison and perform a wide range of analysis. So number of analysis and comparison are provided in the figure. Okay, I'll show you later. I think for this presentation, we should, I'm showing more visually. Okay, so some of the, okay, these are the list of scenario indicator can be uh, used for evaluation, VKT, VHT, vehicle, V-ratio, journey time, PRT demand, and PRT volume. And the, the bottom three are the scenario that we have tested. PT fare discount, base year versus future year, future year with, was without DRT. So for the scenario one, PT fare discount, okay, we assume 20% uh, PT fare discount. So the outcome is, okay, the outcome is, it shows an increase of PT travel demand in the network result from the 20% discount. This fair discount come to play in the mode choice where monetary parts of utility function for PRT is reduced and correspondingly PT become more attractive. It's quite straightforward. Then, For the second scenario, let me click on this. Okay. By introducing the, the DRT system to the future year model to work along with the metro system, what we found is there's an overall reduction in the VHT, VKT, VC ratio, while the total journey time increase is understandable because DRT system in operation serving 70, 30% of cartridge across 
the service area. The figure that you're looking at right now, you can clearly see where the, the prior vehicle decrease, increase, then for public transport, decrease and increase. So it's quite significant that public transport increase with the, and for, the, for private vehicle is decreased on the key road. Okay, then the last scenario that we have tested, okay, is, which is future year with and without DRT. Okay, the figure illustrate the traffic flow variation in the network, the traffic flow generated by the DRT system is also take into consideration more local traffic flow is generated in, in the in vicinity of the pudo nodes in the pudo nodes okay while the significant decrease is obvious on the arterial road you can see the green one the green uh, link uh, bar okay it shows decrease on the, the key arterial road in, within the study area so the before i conclude okay is this exercise, okay, what myself, I learned and with the team, okay, with VZoom, okay, it's just highlights, okay, the capability of VZoom in a broad range of transport modeling aspect from traditional four step demand modeling to futuristic DRT modeling. If let's say, uh, if there's like uh, any of you is interested, you know, like uh, to use or to consider DRT for your master plan studies or maybe some something a new uh, transport mode to introduce in a city wide vizum is a tool yep I'm, I'm quite sure because with the poc that we are we are we have done there's a limitation in the data but let's say in case if you want to discuss more in detail please contact me and coach san so we can discuss more in detail so now i open to the open for q a yeah, that's all. Thanks. And uh, Gochi san, I think it was a very, very interesting uh, topic that you talked about. And Gobi, you're right. Uh, DRT could could be the way to go in terms of uh, public transport planning. Uh, a question from Nathaniel uh, for Gobi. On the DRT, what does a holding area do? Can you repeat the question? There's a breaking here. Okay, on the DRT, what does a holding area do? So the holding area is more of a kind of like nah. It's the nah, it's a kind of like a nah, how it, it's a kind of like interchange. So Holding area is means like someone is traveling, okay, from from in order from their uh, origin. So they go to the holding area and they stop. If let's say there's no passenger, so the 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 DRT will stop for a few minutes before it goes to the uh, end the, to the pudo. Okay. It's it's a, in a way that in a in, a, in transport term, it kind of like waiting area for the bus. To, to pick up more passenger? Is it almost like a bus stop or something like that? Kind of, yeah, kind of like intermediate stop. For longer durations, yeah. For longer duration that you can set up. Okay, okay. And uh, from Hang Wang Yip, may I know the 30% switch from car travel demand in the service area? Is it your estimation or calculated by Vizum? No, this is what uh, we assume. Oh, okay. This is part of the, the modeling assumption that we decide, you know, like, you know, like there is a, a assume 30% switch. But if let's say for VZoom to calculate, uh, VZoom to calculate uh, by itself, you know, as part of the, the process is doable, but unfortunately we don't have, because lacking in the data, that's why we couldn't, go to you know use that approach thanks thanks gobi and from wusian in uh sabana jurong uh, what is the assignment method for the drt trips
Come on, can you repeat again? What is the assignment method for DRP trips? We use a uh, static assignment, equilibrium assignment. Okay. And uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Ang from Strides Mobility, he's asking with this model, how does this evaluate the effectiveness of mass? It, again, in uh, with this model, okay, with this model, it, uh, we can use to evaluate, okay, how much private vehicles taken off from the private, you know, from the road network. So, which is, you know, like which the indicators that we can uh, look at it, VHT, VKT, VC ratio, as a, you know, as a benchmark before and after. In, in your opinion, is there an optimum size to operate a DRP system in terms of area and population? Optimum size, we do won't be able to give, but you know, you can set the fleet size, okay, different size, then look at the, you know, the, the what is the best uh, result to decide the optimum. So, Still, you need to uh, define different optim. Uh, sorry, fleet size to decide which one is the optimum. Right. So, how about land users? Uh, is there is there a, a suitable kind of land use? Not is it is it better okay. in a city setting or, or or school or office setting where it's uh, defined peak periods or is it more residential? Now, for the land, okay, Koichisan, you want to answer this or can I continue? Uh, but actually, the, this is a uh, we need a trial in the, the specific area. Then, in the in the context of mass, so there are a lot of measures for the optimization of the people who life uh, mobility yeah, activities. So the the sub, uh, discount of the subscription and also the the uh, some kind of the uh, service for the peak hour or also the uh, comprehensive services in the uh, for that whole day, so this kind of the the mixture of the major will be the uh, like uh, impact of the mass. So well, now we just prepared for the platform to uh, analyze, evaluate the the optimization of the, the mobility services in this area. So now we are just that kind of point. So we will be able to do the more uh, analysis using this uh, result, I believe. Okay, now, Chairman, just to add uh, Koichi San's uh, uh, explanation. Mm. For me, the way I, the way I see, DRT, if it, you know, like, better serve, uh, how can I say, you know, like with the, uh, I'm from Malaysia, so the concept is get them, um, large scale gated community so large scale gated community community where it serves quite well a large condo or something like that large condo large condo large the uh, right. industrial complex large you know mm. uh, what you call uh, offices uh, call like kind of like office park right right and uh, okay final question uh, what if you want to in include fares into the DRT services into this model? Can you can you integrate fares into it? Okay. Now on this part, now yes, yes, Jinban. Okay. Thanks. Right, we are right on the dot for for Gobi and uh, Goichi San's. Uh, presentation. Thanks a lot for joining us and we'll see Gobi later for, for the second half. Thanks guys. Okay. Thank you very much. And now, now we have got uh, the third um, presenter and before I go to him actually it's a fun fact, fun fact for, for this UGM. Uh, Vaughn, Vaughn, who is the next presenter, he's from the US. And actually, and actually uh, with, in this lineup that we have, uh, 
out of coincidence. I, I, I didn't know until just now when I saw the, 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 the where, where they came from and we have got Japanese presenters, Singaporean, American, Malaysian, German and Indonesian. So really we are quite global in this short three hours. Just a fun fact. Okay. But anyway, we've got we've got Vaughn uh, Lopez Levine uh, from Rambo Vertex, and uh, he's an associate director with the company, and uh, with more than ten years of experience with them in the transportation consultancy. Um, he's of course got international uh, experience, uh, having completed projects not only in Singapore but also in Mexico, Qatar, Vietnam, and of course all over the U.S. Um, and then his topic will be quite interesting. It's uh, slightly different from the technical part of it, but it's uh, utilizing GPS data from TomTom Tom in PTV VZIM simulation. So over to you, Vaughn. Great, thanks, Chunlin. As you mentioned, uh, I will be kind of focusing less on the, the, the nitty gritty technical aspects of, of uh, some of the, the modeling that we do here, but kind of zooming out and looking at what are the, the major problems that, that we face when we go to develop detailed VSIM models, in particular um, at, the, at the micro simulation level. And what we wanna talk about today is utilizing GPS data from, from TomTom specifically into VSIM simulations. This can go okay. So first, I'll do a brief introduction about Ramble, and then we'll talk about the the GPS data that's available, and and the use cases that we've used it before, and how it can support our kind of our sustainability goals as a as a culture and society. So just a quick brief introduction of, of Ramble Vertex. Vertex was a local independent consultancy that was acquired by Ramble a few years ago, and now we're part of the the greater Ramble family of companies, and we have about 16,000 experts in 35 countries with a strong presence here in the Middle East, Asia Pacific area. Now, my group specifically is smart mobility, and we tend to deal with transport problems and address uh, and develop transport solutions. In Middle East, Asia Pacific, in, in particular, we've been growing, and, and we are now in uh, uh, strong, quite strong in Singapore and also in, in Australia. So you should see see us around. Now, when we talk about transport, uh, transport and smart mobility, there are a few core services that that we focus on, and and of course we use Visim and we use PTV solutions for for just about all of these. But of course, it's the the first is the traditional vehicular kind of uh, assessments where we look at, at the different types of, of uh, vehicle problems that, that we face, in particular with new developments and, and master planning areas, et cetera. And we try to, to solve those problems uh, using the traditional and innovative ways, um, methodologies. Then there's surveys. So growing up in this field, really, you learn from the start that the data that you put out of a of a simulation is only as good as the data that you that you input. So we spend a lot of time here at Smart Mobility trying to determine what are the best ways to collect data, what are the highest quality data solutions that we can use to feed our models, and that's kind of what what ended up uh, with us with our topic today. So that that's the kind of surveys component. Then of course there's the there's this car light concept here in Singapore that we always try to support through everything that we do in developing walking cycling plans and things like that. But then there's also this uh, this idea of of data and uh, data that is that is not the traditional tr transport planning data, but but that next layer that we can start to use and really think forward in in how we're going to to solve transport solution transport problems using new data sources. And that that runs in terms of uh, this data. It's, it includes all kinds of things and and things that are not traditionally used as as tra for transport solutions, but we're trying to figure out ways to to use them. One of the most useful pieces of data that we found recently is, is GPS data, and it feeds directly into the modeling that we've done to support our projects here. So let's take a minute and we can zoom out and we can look at what the, what the traditional methodologies are for collecting data and compare it to, to what our kind of new ways of collecting data are. So it, traditionally, we would collect data through video recordings or manual counts. And we would collect all types of data manually or using these videos. This includes speed data. It includes origin, destination, and plate matching, those kinds of things. But the issue is that you're always capturing just a sample 
of of those data of those data points at a specific point in time and a specific geography i.e where you're putting your camera or where you're putting your your person to, to collect the data the where this gets kind of blown open is the gps data this access to to kind of almost infinite data through through gps tracking and the system that we use can provide all, all kinds of, of information, including vehicle position, speed profiles, travel times, route choice, and, and origin destination analysis. But what really sets this apart is that it's not from a specific point in time, uh, from, from a limited point in time. It's from a broad point in time, and you can do comparisons across those, across those points in time. So the data solution that we use is, is TomTom Road Analytics. And they were formed in Amsterdam in 1991, but now they are a global company that collects data from all different areas of the world. Uh, and, and we've actually entered a partnership with them where we have access to this data and can, can provide this data to our clients. So what makes this significant is that the, uh, the TomTom data actually amalgamates information from all different sources. It has uh, numerous types of data that it brings together and uh, to form one coherent data set without you having to go through and clean any of the data. So of course the, the sources originated from when we used to have in unit devices in our cars and, and TomTom was a leader in that area. So those still are out there and those feed part of this data, but they also collect data from, from uh, applications, mobile applications on smartphones where TomTom actually has a, a contract to, to deliver that, uh, to deliver mapping services and things of that nature. But they also have agreements to supplement this data. They, they have entered agreements with, with different fleets and different freight providers. So for example, in-car units such as the ones installed in Renaults or Daimlers, BMWs, et cetera, when it's provided by TomTom, that data actually feeds back to this data system and is included in the, the kind of universal data that you can, you can get uh, access to through this system. And that includes also data from smartphone apps and from, from various fleets. This is just a cross section of the, of the partners that, that TomTom has. And you can see it's a, it's a wide range of, of partners that feeds in there. You can see PTV is actually on there as well. So let's talk about the data types that, that you can access. The first is, uh, is speed profiles. And what I like about this is that uh, just like uh, when you would go access Google and they paint the roads you know, green, red, orange, et cetera, you, this does the same thing, but to a much greater level of detail. You can provide average speeds, you can get median speeds, percentiles, et cetera. And another reason I like this is because you can do it over periods of time uh, through through using any kind of historical profile. So you can go back years, for example, and figure out what was the speeds at a specific time, uh, at, the, at the time potentially maybe that you've done your surveys, for example, and you want to understand the, the speed data from that, from that timing. The next piece of information that, that they can provide is, is travel time. Of course, it's a natural extension of, of speed, but it helps you to understand travel times in uh, route choice methods. So from point A to point B, you would know, for example, how long it took to go using route A and route B, as opposed to just one kind of amalgamated travel time that tells you the average. And what, what I like about this, again, is you can take these profiles and extrapolate them and understand how those vary over a day. So you can see how it happened, how it how the travel time is affected by the peak hours, and you can see how it how it changes throughout the day or throughout periods that, that you want to look at. Then you can do comparisons of, of data, which I, I've talked a little bit about already, but you can compare various time periods of uh, even of the same time periods over some historical uh, some sort of historical eras. So for example, you can compare Monday through Friday speed data on a typical January, um, let's say January week in 2021 and compare how that uh, compares to 2019. So you can do a pre-pandemic post-pandemic evaluation, for example. And we find that that's, that's been useful in some of our, our BISIM models. Then I think one of the more powerful, uh, powerful tools in this system is you can actually extract origin destination data over very, very large areas. 
So you can understand not only where people are coming from and going to, but you can understand what their midpoints might be and, and what various routes they're taking to get to those points. And I think the, the value of this is, is a bit self-evident because you can then take this data and create origin destination matrices. So here, for example, is an origin destination matrix of, of Copenhagen over a broad area. And the, the benefit of this system is that because of its ability to look at periods of, of uh, periods of time, your sample size is not limited to what would traditionally be potentially all the red cars or all the cars with license plates ending in P or whatever the system was. What you actually get is a reasonable sample size of, of all different types of vehicles going between, going between the, the various points. So, so this data is great, but, but where is it available? And it's becoming more and more available, of course, uh, over time as, uh, as TomTom expands their, their reach. The benefit that we see is that it's obviously uh, available here in, in Singapore, but every little green dot you see here is also another country where it's available in, in Asia. So, so uh, kind of the, the, the bigger markets would be India and, uh, and Australia, places like that. But, but they have a wide coverage of, of data allowing you to use this data in projects where you might not even have a presence, a physical presence. So how do we use this data? So there, there's kind of two different levels of, of data that we've used to calibrate our models and, and kind of enhance our models. The first is, of course, the origin destination data that, that, I, that I mentioned before. For a large area, let's say you're doing a, a impact assessment, for example, for a new port or something like that. You can create a cordon and identify all of your origin destination points and extract that pattern, travel pattern data without having to do kind of expensive on the ground surveys. Then that data can be input into the model, of course. One thing to note here, I will, I will take a minute to talk about this, is that I, at this point, this type of data is not necessarily a replacement for, for, your, for your traditional, for all of your traditional traffic counts, for example. You still do need to supplement it with, with uh, counts at, at key points, although this is something that, that's being worked on in the background. But once combined, this data allows you to significantly enhance the accuracy of the model that you're developing. So uh, first there's the origin destination and travel pattern. And then second, there's historical travel time and travel speed. So for example, I already talked about this a bit, but you can you can look at the travel time between points A and B uh, prior to your development be, being implemented by several years. And then you can also, <clears throat> excuse me, you can also look at the how that travel time has changed and the speed data has changed as various key infrastructure improvements have been implemented. So you can look at it historically, but you can also use this as a for as a point of future comparison. So for example, if you're doing a transport impact assessment, as a as my previous example, you can do an assessment of the existing conditions and have that data readily available so that once the the development is actually implemented in a couple of years, you can actually go back and do a comparison and say, okay, did this did this development have the impacts that it did, that it was anticipated to have? And how has it changed travel through through the area? But item B it initially in a in a in a model is used for calibration of the model. So of course there's the, the kind of two components to a model, the two parent components. The first is the, the capacity. Now that is, like I was saying before, that is something that you still need to, to go collect on site uh, through various, various means. But then the demand data is really where this adds value. So for example, you can, you can bring in origin destination, you can, uh, using that in combination with some, with some key junction counts, for example, you can run a matrix estimation and get incredibly accurate outputs. And of course, those are, those are calibrated with, uh, with some turning and link flows. Uh, but what you'll get is models with GEHs that are, that are really stellar. So let's look at some cases where we, we've kind of used this. Uh, the first is uh, a region around Changi Airport here in Singapore. You can see this example, we, we've identified four regions because we needed to understand how people are traveling on the, in particular on the expressways and how the, they avoid the expressways when there, is, uh, when there is congestion. So we identified these four regions and then what the system does automatically is identify other potential alternate routes and, it's, and it extracts the, the total distance 
that that would uh, that's being evaluated. Once you've done that step, of course, you can you can set your 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 data ranges. So again, what I like here is you can pick, for example, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for every week in March, for example, of 2019, and you can you can have it synthesize that data and spit out the averages of all of that data and the, the kind of average OD. So that way you're getting a really large, really comprehensive sample size. Whereas before you would have one point on one day or uh, or you would have data collected across you know, multiple typical traffic days and you'd have to stitch that together. There's no such need for that in, in this. Then once you, run to, uh, would run this, this assessment, spits out an origin destination matrix with the, with the sample size. And you can see those sample sizes are in the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. And that's because we looked at a month. And you can see down here on the bottom left, we looked at April of 2019. Now, again, we specified all day. So this is comprehensive in terms of the, it will get the full sample that's available. But you could say to just do between 6 and 9 AM, for example, and extract that data only. Then of course we would put that into Visim and we would run the, the matrix correction. So another area that we've used this before is, is using the, the kind of the traffic statistics, the, um, the speed statistics to validate some, some Visim models. So again, when you're, when you're looking at speeds, when you're looking at travel times, for example, you can also select the dates and select the, the time periods that you want, just as we did with the origin de destination data. Now, in this particular example, we wanted to look at times during peak hours, but also uh, for, for all day. So from a.m. peak through the p.m. peak. So you can see that's 7 a.m. through 9 p.m. on the right-hand side. This was for a project over along Commonwealth Avenue, and we needed to understand what this travel time was in, in real time for, uh, for the, the dates that we looked at uh, we actually collected the, the traffic data from. So for this particular project, you'll see this blue line, it crosses a number of junctions. We actually have turning movement counts for those junctions at a specific date in, uh, I believe it was 20, 2019, I don't remember. But the, the benefit of this is we can actually go back and look at the travel time from the dates that we collected the turning movement counts so we could understand how that travel time compared to to uh, to what was in the Visim model, and then that was a, that was used to calibrate the model itself. Here you can see you've got the sample size, uh, you can get the speeds on here, and then it, and once you click analyze, it'll pop out this uh, interesting graph where it'll tell you the the speed profile and the percentile that, of speeds uh, that that's achieving. So you can tell if it's a slow traffic day or if it's a fast traffic day, for example. And then it'll also tell you, this is really super small, I apologize for that, but at the bottom it'll tell you the average and the median and the, and the, uh, the sample size, et cetera. So then what, what we had to do here is, is, this was basically the project area. We did a VISIM model of this project area here, and uh, you can see all the junctions that are included and it stretches along that, that, that area that was identified in the slide previously, which is kind of summarized here. And the, the key concern by the client was what was happening along this Commonwealth Avenue here during the peak hour. And that was the, that was the primary item that we're supposed to evaluate the, the project on. So how does it impact these, these travel times? So what we needed to do was figure out what were the travel times in real life during the day, the days that we, we captured the, the surveys. And how did that compare to what we're getting in Visum? And actually, LTA in their uh, in their uh, traffic impact assessment guidelines, they outline a process by which we are supposed to to compare the the uh, travel times in in Visim for micro simulations to to what is actually observed on the ground. And they give you thresholds for for what's acceptable. And using this method, we were able to determine that our our model was was well calibrated. So those are kind of the practical examples that we've. We use this data for. Now we can also use this data for for a number of other uh, items, such as our sustainability goals. So the the first the first item is is GPS position. I mean, this is a little bit obvious in that we we don't need to deploy as much manpower. We don't need to to send people out into, for example, harm's way or waste the petrol to go out and and collect the data. Instead, we can simply extract the GPS positions and and understand comprehensively what's going on. Again, the, the real-time aspect of this, while it is it's not 
fully real time, it's quite close to it in terms of uh, the availability of data close to, to the date that you're, you're looking for. So for today, we could we could actually go back to, as, as I believe as close as last week and grab the data for, for that. And that really helps you do uh, maybe real time is not the quite quite the right word, but really uh, current evaluations in a, for example, a construction setting of, of what the what is happening to travel patterns, what is happening to performance of the roads as compared to, to you know, a few months ago. Then we can also use this for pattern recognitions, looking at slices of time over time, what we can see, and we can narrow this down to a specific development, for example, or parcel, uh, URA parcel, for example. You can understand how travel patterns have changed to and from that development over time and subsequently, you can test, you can, well, you can see before and after the fact, if, for example, a car light development has been implemented, how has, how has the travel patterns changed or how have the, the vehicles, the vehicle behaviors changed in the area? Do we see less movements at certain junctions because there, that's being replaced by pedestrians and cyclist movements, et cetera? And just in general, and I'll, I'll end with this, I think it, it generally supports this idea of, of car light because as we develop these solutions to help suppress car usage and to help really vary our modes, we can actually look at what's happening on our roads in near real time and understand the impacts of that. And I think as, as we go forward to our, our Vision 2030, for example, in Singapore, we could really look at, at the data over the years, maybe year by year, to understand how general travel patterns have been changing as we incre increment car light measures and as we really transition away from uh, kind of uh, single user cars to, to maybe more holistic and sustainable solutions. So with that, I'd like to open it for questions. Thanks, Vaughn. So I remember for those of us uh, a little bit older, when we started the, our, our career with uh, manual counting. I think we all have our war stories about it. And uh, those were the days before handphones, mobile phones were, were like what it is today. And and I always say, you know, uh, if, if we try to replicate uh, manual counting in today's context, all you need, all you need is just one person watching a Korean drama and then all our, all our, <laughs> all That's our right. Yeah, yeah. So, so all our okay, data will be all funky and all that. So, okay. So, um, a quick question for Vaughn uh, from Nathaniel: What's the difference between the green and dark green dots when you were sharing about the global availability of the data? Ah, let me go back to that slide. Okay, I think that th this was pointing out our core markets uh, from from a ramble perspective. So really, when there's data availability, it's the same level of data in all of the blue the blue areas, the blue geographies. Thanks. And then from Zako, does the general public or any consultant have any access to the level of detail in TomTom data required for the OD analysis, or is it only available to organizations who have special agreements with TomTom? Uh, so, so we, yeah, we have a special distribution license for this. So you can always uh, ask ask us. I mean, we can we can provide data for for you uh, as a service. So we're the authorized reseller out here in Singapore. Okay, we'll 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 get people to email you after that. Um, from Zuraidi, in terms of resources, has Ramble been able to gauge the amount of savings by percentage when adopting this method? Oh, uh, sure. So, so when we, uh, you, can, you can see right here. So the origin destination information that goes into the demand component of a of a model. The, I mean, we, it 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 costs. Sure, there's a cost for buying it. For example, wholesale from from TomTom, Tom, but the cost of that pales in comparison to the cost of hiring aunties watching K dramas trying to collect this this data uh, or or deploying deploying uh, cameras for example and I think by by orders of magnitude of 10 plus so I mean this is this is indeed a, a significant cost saver for for anyone that runs especially wider area models so in terms of time saving cost savings and accuracy it's much yeah, better I mean 
it's it's definitely worth it. I mean, even if it was the same cost, I would say it's worth it because the accuracy is tremendous uh, in terms because it, it you know the GPS doesn't lie <laughs> and it doesn't fall asleep. Yeah, and 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 you were saying it usually comes in conjunction with your video analytics. Yeah, so so usually what we'll do on our on our projects is we'll we'll use this data to understand the the broader transport patterns within the study area. But then we'll also take junction counts at, at key nodes because you need a control uh, in, in some circumstances to, the, to calibrate this thing to the to the local level that you need to. So we'll we'll supplement it. But what the benefit is, is that you, you don't need to do that on at every junction, for example. You can do that at the key ones that are that are the important ones. And with this information fed by those junction counts, you can basically understand travel behavior through all the junctions that you're looking at. Okay, I know this is a little bit, uh, you know, in, in, in current situation, there are different ways of, of, of doing this method of uh, determining queue length at each junction. Now, does the GPS method uh, address this? Oh, sure. Okay. so. Q length specifically, uh, the, it will give you indicative understanding of it because by virtue of the speed data that you can extract, you understand where uh, if the median speed is under 10 kilometers per hour, for example, that, that that's a QE, that's an area that has queues. Uh, typically in a in a project in Singapore, I know LTA's preference is to understand like how many vehicles is in a queue, but this could be a relatively good approximation for that if the if the detailed queue length is not required, for example. You know, to the fifth meter, for you know, for example. But this could be used to understand that it's approximately 200 meters or approximately 500 meters. That's great. That's great. Okay, final final question before we go on a very short toilet co or coffee break. Uh, from City, uh, hi Vaughn. For the OD analysis, what is the data source used? GPS from mobile phone. And when you specified about defining the region, does it mean you have to define the polygon of an area for the OD purpose? Ah, that's a that's a great question. So in uh, so it it the data source is from a number of sources. So what TomTom does is it amalgamates all of the data sources where they have contracts with with certain providers. So uh, like I said before, that the TomTom itself, those little units or anywhere that TomTom -tom is the back end to a in-car unit, it, it pulls that data automatically. So that could be from you know, your Mercedes that you're driving or, or whatever. Uh, but then they also have layers of other data that they, that they integrate with the, data, with the data set. So those come from fleets, for example. So the trucking fleets and, and things, that, uh, th those kinds of delivery services where they do have agreements with them, all that data is pumped in. Now you can't, you can't strip out what type of data you're looking at in the system. It, it lumps it all together and gives you one clear picture across all the data sets. Okay, I, I okay, it's very interesting. It's just one, one, one final one confirm. Sure. What is the number of trips captured by TomTom Tom as compared to the total trips made at the area in percentage? The Tom, ah, so like the sample size you're asking about. So, so yeah, of course that, that, that varies. I, I mean, there's no way to say it's exactly right because it depends on who's driving where, but in general, we found that it's approximately 20, 20% plus depending on your area, depending on the uptake of TomTom, of, Tom, of course. Uh, but in, in Singapore, I believe it's around 20%, which is yes. statistically pretty significant. Oh, and I didn't answer the previous question about, uh, about the cordon. So when you're identifying a, a development, for example, that you want to have as the origin point and in your origin destination matrix, you need to make sure that you, you cover all the road or access points that are coming in and out. So you just draw your box around that that uh, that area, making sure if you have four, for example, four access points, that it covers all four access points, and then it, it'll get everything coming in and out. Great, great. Thanks, Vaughn. Thanks, Vaughn. So uh, that comes to the end of our first session. I guess we'll have a five-minute break. The time is exactly 2.30. We'll come back at 2.35 for the next group of sessions uh, chaired by Kobe. All right, catch you later. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, sticking with us till the afternoon.
I promise you the second half of this presentation is going to be even better than the first half. Uh, let me introduce our next moderator and speaker for the afternoon session. I'm sure you're all familiar with Gobi Gopal, our technical director in PTV Asia Pacific. Uh, Gobi has over 20 years of international experience specializing in strategic, mesoscopic, microsimulation traffic modeling and development of GIS and traffic model interfaces. I think Gobi brings a wealth of experience across the Middle East, Asia Pacific and in Australia where he spent many a year not only for school but also for work. So before I, uh, I, I wouldn't take up much more of the time, maybe I can turn it over to you, Gobi. I'll, okay. For the second of the session, I'll take over from Chenman as a moderator. So the next topic, welcoming Parehan to present his topic, estimation of trans -dog bus passenger matrix using least square and T-flow fuzzy method. I'm looking forward for the your presentation, Parehan. So about Parehan, Parehan okay, uh, is a lecturer in the civil department, vocational college, Universita Gajah Mada, and a researcher. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in transportation system and engineering in 2029 from University Gajah Mada. His interest in transport planning and modeling, sub, uh, major in road network and public transport planning. Parehan also well versed in PTV VZoom and VZIM suits. Okay, Parehan, now I pass it to you for your presentation. Okay, uh, first let me introduce myself. My name is Raihan. Currently, I'm working as a lecturer at Universitas Gajah Mada in Indonesia. Um, this, uh, this is short information about me. If you have any question, don't be hesitate to contact me by email or LinkedIn. And I will start uh, to present about my research, uh, estimating bus passenger origin destination matrix using least square in T-flow fuzzy methods by PTV Pison, a case in Yogyakarta City. Okay, uh, the outline for this presentation are introduction, literature review, method, and result, and the last is conclusion. Uh, conclusion. Okay, first I will explain about the location of the study. This is uh, Indonesia and the location of the study in the in the middle of uh, Java Island. And this is the location, Yogyakarta City. Uh, Yogyakarta City is a quite small area. You can see that uh, red line is a arterial, arterial road, uh, which is the Yogyakarta is surrounded by arterial road. And Yogyakarta City is regarded also as a city of education, culture, and tourism. Uh, there are many university, historical building, and destination for tourists. And we can uh, we now talk about public transport. So uh, I will tell you about uh, BRT-like system in Yogyakarta. We called by Trans Yogyakarta bus. Uh, the system, uh, this system is consisting of 17 routes and 283 uh, buses. And we can look to the picture below. Uh, that is the bus and the bus stop in Yogyakarta. And the capacity of the Trans Yogyakarta is around 35 or 40 passenger. And Trans Yogyakarta operates from 5.30 uh, a.m. to 9.30 p.m. And the first problem is low demand for a public transport. Uh, there are several, there are two uh, charts in this slide. First is about the mode share in Yogyakarta City. And uh, the data I got from home interview survey from the Department of Transportation in 2016, uh, it can be seen that 
more than two thirds of the respondent uh, use motorcycle as uh, their main vehicle, whereas only 0.3% of them choose or use transit bus. And we move to the right picture. This is data about the number of passengers from the 2013 until 2017. Uh, there is a downtrend from 2014 uh, until or to 2017, around 25%. And regarding to the data, uh, the problem is or uh, the problem in Yogyakarta is the uh, first like first mile and last mile trip is uh, not supported by a feeder and I think it can decrease and the attraction of using bus also the roads of Trans Jogja bus is not directed to the destination of the passenger and they need longer travel time uh, than using the conventional bus uh, before the Trans Yogya exists. So Trans Yogya bus is a new mode in Yogyakarta. It's since from 2008. And the next slide is about um, the behavior of the passenger in Yogyakarta. I got the information or the data from the previous study. Uh, there are a lot of data in here and I will start from uh, the gender. First, uh, passenger is dominated by women uh, around 61% in Yogyakarta and the work type of the passenger is dominated by student 61% and if we look to the right picture about the travel distance pie chart, more than one third or 35% of the passengers use Transjokia for a short trip or less than five kilometers. So uh, in 2018, the survey conducted and the fact is uh, the passenger use Transjogja for a short trip. And if we look to the right picture, uh, we can see the frequency of using Transjogja. And from this picture, we can see that passengers are dominated by frequent user or more than one or two times in a week to use uh, the Transjogja bus. This is uh, the fact uh, in the field that Trans Jogja bus uh, is, uh, is still low for the demand and uh, the kind of the trip is a uh, short trip. And the next is uh, from the data or the problems, I propose uh, research about estimation or estimate uh, Trans Jogja bus passenger audi matrix using two models in PTV Vism. I use uh, this model to uh, know the best of uh, two models and evaluate the operation and the service. And then to propose uh, the new routes to improve the performance of Trans Jogja. And the benefits from the results. Uh, First, generating Trans Jogja bus uh, audit metrics. So, uh, government, researcher, or uh, other elements can uh, use uh, the audit metrics for the basis of planning and with the low cost because there, there is a survey for the volume, uh, only for uh, volume in each route. And assessing the best estimation model between the flow policy and least square based on the passenger volume and providing recommendation to uh, policy makers regarding uh, the evaluation service level and the performance. 
And the next is about the short information about the literary literary review. I deliver about uh, two model. This is uh, Tiflofazi, the first time uh, used by Frederick and Mott in 2000. They use uh, this model to estimate the current metrics uh, based on prior metrics in 1996, based on passenger volume in 1997, and the earlier research from Yusifika, Riza, and Muridpur in 2013, present that Tiflofazi generated better result in descriptive statistics in terms of less error value. Uh, they considered a uh, root choice proportion, uh, updated successfully. And the last is Sas Rasov and Pikina in 2017, construct a audiometric based on a probability audiometrics from video recording and traffic counting. And they use also, uh, and they also use uh, Tiflo Fizy method. And the last about E square, I mentioned the Cascata research. Uh, he applied E square methods based on the traffic count. He compared the square and entropy maximizing. Uh, and then he concluded that the square has lower mean square error than entropy maximizing. So uh, from the liter literature review, I will take uh, further methods. And the uh, first type, uh, this is about literative review, uh, particularly about estimation model, public transport assignment, and evaluation. And the second step is data collection. And you know that the research is fully uh, using secondary data, like the metrics from 2018 and the volume for uh, in 2018, 2019, the timetable about the heat headway, uh, the data of locate the data uh, of bus, bus stop and then the routes and then the route network uh, and then about the planning. And the third step, is about model construct. Uh, this is a uh, road network model and uh, build the public transport system. And the fourth step is about the estimation, uh, about the two models estimation. And the last is about the evaluation and replaning, uh, rerouting planning. And the result, uh, this is my model construct. Uh, because Yogyakarta is quite small, I think uh, the zone is, this model is only 20 zone based on the sub-district, based on the previous data, and the number of route is 17, and then the bus stop is, is 200 and, uh, 283 bus stop, and I input the uh, free flow speed uh, and then the capacity in this model by manually and the next is about the input order metrics like i said before i use a uh, proportional matrix and then i multiply with the patient total passenger volume uh, in 2018 so i have a prior matrix to uh, to be assigned in the model. And we can see uh, at the estimation result, first you can see it uh, in, in the right, uh, the procedure sequence I, I do. Uh, the first is the assignment and then uh, reporting the PUT counts and then doing the correction uh, from the T-flow fuzzy and then the estimation from the uh, least square, and the next is about uh, assignment again from the correction, and I see the statistical test from the assignment, and I do a uh, operating indicator for the public transport, and the last is analysis for the assignment. And we move to the left. Uh, there are two metrics from the estimation model, I conclude that both of estimation model generated high level of R square close to one and low 
RMSE and percentage of uh, GE uh, uh, more than five equal to 100 percent and if you see that uh, there is a red color in the matrix uh, it means that uh, there is a cell with uh, value close to zero so uh, i give a sign in the table so if we compare uh, between t flow and uh, least square um, the number of zero value or close to zero in each cells is uh, large in large uh, in uh, is large in least square model and i think from the statistical test uh, both of them is good and I choose the T flow fuzzy because this square doesn't result in better cell value compared to the T flow fuzzy because the least square uh, cannot maintain the ratio between the prior matrix and the current matrix. And the next is about the evaluation. Uh, this is uh, the desired line most trips is coming from or to north side of the network uh, because there are many uh, residents uh, universities uh, commercial area and the uh, load factor only one root is uh, or has a high load factor and overall if we uh, see uh, the others load factor in its trans bus road is still relatively low and the next is about the walking distance uh, we can see that there are a gaps of bus stop in the west and the south east area which means that the surface of trans Yogyakarta is not sufficient and increase the walking time and distance and the right is it is about uh, journey time presented by isochron in vism uh, we can see that if we start a trip from the dark color area it means that we need more than 50 minutes uh, of journey time. And, but if we start a trip from the bright color area, we can have a journey time less than 50 minutes or less than uh, 30 minutes. And the last is about my routing plan. Uh, I propose routing plan based on the previous problem, previous evaluation, and uh, I use from uh, the previous study from the Angelina in 2013, she proposed uh, several uh, quite different routes from the existing, uh, but in now I'm use the route for uh, different OD demand. Like uh, we can see that uh, there are, uh, I'm sorry, I think my picture is quite small, but uh, from the 11 routes, uh, there is a radial route and then circular, uh, circular route. And from the rerouting plan, we can see from the conclusion uh, in the right side, uh, we have an increases of operational and services performance from the existing to the rerouting plan. Uh, we can see from the travel time from 29 minutes to 27 minutes and the waiting time, uh, like the transfer waiting time from 10 minutes to three minutes and the headway from 22 minutes to nine minutes and the speed of Trans Jogja from 16 km per hour to 20 km per hour. So uh, if you see the average of load factor is still low because I don't analyze uh, the potential demand because I fully use second, uh, secondary data and I don't uh, I don't uh, I don't carry out uh, primary survey for uh, potential demand. And the conclusion is the T-flow fuzzy method is a good method for predict the OD pair since it can also maintain the ratio of OD pair and existing performance show that the demand is still low and the accessibility also need to be improved. 
and overall from the routing plan uh, produce a better result for the service level and operational performance and the suggestion the future studies need to consider the potential demand of uh, like um, more choice based on uh, new road scenario and then we can know uh, the shifting from private to the public transport and the next is further for the research also needs to review the other parameter like the cost uh, like the from the uh, cost from the passenger view uh, that's all pagobi from me thank you parehan okay, yes. there are there are few questions okay there are few questions for you from the participants okay yeah so the first question is it this square base is on total boarding for each line and what is the screen line that you have used from jeffrey ang smrt okay could you repeat it my connection is bad is now. least base okay, is least Square base on total boarding for each line. Oh, sorry, sorry. Could you repeat it, or just type any uh, column, chat column? Okay. Probably we move to the next one. Now, from Rainy from Indonesia, can you explain about algorithm for PUT assignment that you use for headway base assignment? Okay. Uh, I can hear clearly. Uh, first, because my research use secondary data, I only get uh, headway, uh, average of headway in each route. Um, and I decide to use a headway because from my data is not completed from, uh, from the start of operate operation and then the end of operation so i use constant headway in this model and the assignment is about the headway i'm uh, i don't use i don't use timetable because the lack of the data data yeah because timetable require more data and more in a longer run time okay then yes. the second question quickly we go through we, we do have like another one or two minutes is the more is the model calibrated calibrated take into account the load profile for each line oh, could you repeat it sorry is the model calibrated the model that you you know you use for your evaluation okay calibrated take into account the load profile for each line so load profile it means that let's say you run for two hours and what is the the, the profile Okay. So the okay. calibration up to that level. Okay. No, uh, I just run for uh, once, and I think because my model is quite quite small, I think I don't need uh, uh, much time. I think it's a simple model. So. Okay. So you just did a flat estimation comparison. Am I right? Yes, yeah, right. So then the then the last one, is there any effect on the rerouting as planned? Uh sorry. Um is there any effect on the rerouting as planned okay. by Paul Adrian? Okay. Uh first uh I don't consider uh private or PRT assignment in here, only public transport. So I only get a result from the change of the demand from the route A to my uh, rerouting plan. So I cannot uh, explain because I don't do the change in the shifting from uh, private vehicle to the public transport. Okay, last question from my side, now, Paraya. I think you, you're getting more questions, probably you can. Now, probably uh, reply to them. 
uh, previously with my modeling uh, project, when you run, you, when you use, you know, this matrix estimation, it tend to create short distance trips. Means, yeah, because in order to, in order to calibrate, in order to achieve the target that you set, it tend to create a lot of short trips between between nearby zones. So do you get that sort of pattern in your estimation for the comparison? Uh, I, okay, thank you, uh, Pagopi. From my model, uh, I don't have, uh, or I just uh, don't compare the, it's root from the existing uh, and uh, it's root in the, uh, rerouting plan. So I just uh, see in the overall uh, performance. So uh, it is it, it needs uh, more improvement to get the better result for the each line. So I think I cannot uh, present about the each line uh, because I don't do that. So the, the distribution. Yeah. Okay. Now thanks, Padayan. Now, thanks for you know very informative uh, presentation, and I'm quite sure not one or two. Most of our participants are actually their interest in matrix estimation. Please have a chat with uh, Parehan. Okay, thanks, Parehan. Then we move to the next uh, presentation okay. topic. Thank you. Hi, Johan. Hi, Kamal. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So, unfortunately, okay. my camera is not working. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, we, nah, we do have your but picture you on the... Your... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nah, you know, thanks for joining nah, and present, nah, presenting at PTV in a UGM in a Singapore 2021. The topic that Johan and Kamal are going to present is a joint presentation. The topic is improving air quality emission calculation from Bosch. So I give you a quick background of Kamal and Johan. Since 2029, Kamal is a product manager of air quality solution by Bosch, that's responsible for portfolio management business model development, and strategy for air quality product and digital service. And for Johan, our micro my, product manager for micro simulation mobility based in, in uh, Karlsruhe, Germany. And also Johan also responsible for PTV product for portfolio in context of simulation, specifically the traffic flow simulation tool, PTV VZIM, and the pedestrian simulation software, PTV VSPOR. So he's the go-to person if you have any question, visit him and we spoke. Okay, without wasting, uh, without delaying anything, so I'll let you guys to start the presentation. Great, Jochen, can you go further with the presentation or? So first, um, a quick uh, overview about um, Bosch. Um, in one minute, it's a global company with a um, big uh, footprint in the whole world with more than 400,000 employees um, existing even in every single um, um, country in the world. Uh, more than 40,000 developers also around the world in the research and development. Um, Bosch, Bosch invested uh, six to seven millions billions in research and development in order to have the best products and services in the world. And uh, regarding air quality, um, the presentation and the development of the global X house system development was by Bosch. Sensor development for X house and atmosphere chemists are also uh, from the automotive part, and that was uh, one of the main. Uh, motivations for Bosch to enter into uh, the air quality business. 
In 2019, we decided to bring several um, topics together. Uh, on the left side, uh, the emission, environmentally sensitive traffic management, uh, where we calculate and model the emissions coming out from the X house according to our expertise in the automotive world. On the right side, we have also um, air quality monitoring box uh, certified from a well-known environmental uh, institute in uh, Europe, according to specific Europe regulations and American regulations. And in the middle, we can see dispersion modeling where we name it closing the loop by uh, bringing the emissions from the vehicles and the ambient air quality together into one simulation tool, entering also the weather and the wind topics in order to understand where are uh, the hotspots from the emissions and from the air quality. Today, I will present you the uh, emission modeling. Uh, it was integrated by PTV in their VISM model. On the left side, you can see the macroscopic approach where it's uh, from um, several uh, competitors uh, being uh, implemented um, with uh, an average of uh, street-wide emissions. <coughs> On the right side, you can see the microscopic approach from Bosch, where we can go into um, the small segments on the streets up to or down to 20 meters to see the emissions really on the real hotspots and not only on averaging uh, the whole street. With real driving validated emission model, over 100 vehicle types, um, most common in the EU. So all the EU classes are um, within validated within this model and an overall accuracy of 85 percent was done from uh, an environmental institute and a well-known traffic institute in europe and even for the co2 footprint over 95 percent accuracy further please one most important thing why do we need microscopic in comparison to macroscopic approach is um, on this slide so we know that um, very the dynamic the driving dynamic is a very very important topic to understand in order to understand the emissions on the road and uh, by looking on the table um, if i start on the left side constant driving between 20 and 40 kilometer per hour by 100 percent going into a constant driving between 40 and 140 so by accelerating and decelerating i will come uh, to 70 and maybe the most big thing to say is by the accelerating um, this is the fifth one accelerating states between zero and 20 kilometer this is what we know from almost the whole um, hot spots uh, by traffics and by um, green waves we have an emission of over 60 650 percent in comparison to the constant driving and this gives us uh, the importance of having this microscopic approach in order to understand on the 20 meter level where do we have to um, change something in order to reduce the emissions Can you go further? Thank you. This is um, proof of concept that we made in Stuttgart. Uh, what you can see here is the vehicle velocity on the uh, Y axis. On the X axis is the meter of the street, so the um, street of, uh, of Bad Cannstatt. And you can see where the ample, where the traffic light is, uh, the most stops on, on the traffic lights. And after the traffic lights, you can see the most emissions done because of the accelerating after that. And what we calculated for the city of Stuttgart is um, on which way can we um, decline this uh, stop and go? So what are the possibilities to decline this stop and go? And which velocity should we implement in order to um, improve the emissions and reduce the emissions on a specific way. <clears throat> on the right side, you can see also the slowdown. 
but it's uh, because of the cross around. So going into the results of the proof of concept of uh, Stuttgart after several calculations um, in, uh, on this street, we defined a velocity of 40 uh, kmh uh, because uh, we may uh, reduce uh, the stop and go on, on a level that we can reduce also uh, the emissions um, in a very good way. So you can see the two curves, uh, the lila and the blue one, and the one in the middle is the average one. So if we want to compare, to make a comparison between uh, the microscopic and microscopic approach, you can see from the macroscopic approach, it will give one line, not, not even known where is the acceleration, where is the deceleration. And by going into the microscopic approach on the blue one, we can see that uh, there is a big, um, on, on the lila one, you can see, and the violet one, you can see that there is a big uh, acceleration and deceleration uh, there where we have the 40 kmh. And after having the measure uh, to reduce the temperature, um, we see a reduction of um, emissions up to 20% on this level, uh, only by implementing um, this uh, small measure by having uh, 40 kmh without having any boxes, without having any um, further investment from the city in order to reduce the emission by implementing filters or something like this. And this is what we name as low-hanging fruit because it's really a very, very small uh, invest together with VISM where we can see where to implement uh, the right um, measures. You're muted, Jochen. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for the presentation. Um, also, like, um, yeah, interesting to see, um, like, how good Bosch and how precise Bosch is in this emission um, calculation. And similar to a study, what uh, Kamal has presented, what they did in uh, Stuttgart with real vehicles, um, with real trajectories. Of course, uh, it's quite expensive, or it's uh, it's, it's Hard to do that, and we want to make that available to all of you already in the planning in the simulation process. So a similar study, like what if I do instead of 50 kilometers per hour, 40 kilometers per hour, um, what is the change in emissions? This can be now be done using VISM, and I will show you more how this is being done. So what you need to do is to first prepare your model. So you need to define emission. Um, glass distribution. And this glass distribution takes into account how old are the vehicles, what engine is there, um, is it gasoline, diesel, um, how old is some um, emission uh, classes. And you will need to assign this emission glass distribution to vehicle types. I'll show you that in a second in the software. Then you just need to check, okay, I want to have the emission evaluations. You, you check that in the evaluation configuration. You run the simulation and then the trajectories of vehicles will be uploaded automatically after the simulation run to the Bosch Cloud, this Bosch ESTM service, but what Kamal just presented. And for them, it doesn't matter if that is a real trajectory or it's a simulated trajectory. The calculation is uh, the same and the results, the emission results for each vehicle will be sent back to VISM and we aggregate them then in um, link evaluations or net, uh, vehicle network performance. And then you can analyze and visualize the results. So let me quickly show you, for example, you have an existing network like this example. Uh, it's an example we sent out. It's a simple T intersection. Um, and you see here uh, we have set up a simulation with a signal control. And now we want to add this Bosch vision calculation to it. So, and how it works is uh, you first here in base data distribution emission class. Um, this is a new object. And if you add a new emission class here, you have a total of 182 different emission class. So this is heavy duty vehicle um, category. Um, there are different of them, um, city bus, coach, Richard truck. And then here the different EU um, emission um, classes stages it's called here 
um, a one, two, three, four, three uh, fuel type diesel and some other. I'll explain later. And then you can enter a share. So this is, for example, five, 25%, this is 75%. So this is how it works. This is, of course, first you need to have this data and uh, it's a little bit tricky to enter the data, but we provide, and this is why I do now read additionally a network. We deliver an example. This is called Harvey EFA emission class distribution. Um, Harvey EFA is a, a regulation on emissions more in the German area. I'm not sure where it applies also in Asia, but we plan also together with Bosch to prepare such an emission class distribution for different Asian countries, starting from uh, December, maybe early next year. And if you import that, so I mark non for reading, I only import the emission class distribution. And now you see it imported a total of um, 169 um, such of a uh, different emission class distribution. Do you see for the year, for the vehicle, for the country, um, and if it's average, motorway, rural, and urban. And we want to do now in this simulation, we just want to have um, Germany urban. So everything which does not contain German, uh, we delete. And everything what does not contain urban, we also delete. We get rid of the filter. We only have the ones who has Germany in it and urban. And here we have it different for couches, rigid truck, trucks and trailer. I'll later show you where you find the explanation. And if we, for example, look at passenger cars in Germany, urban, like if we display uh, the cars equals not zero. So this is it's also so the, the most common vehicle in Germany um, in, is uh, Euro 4 vehicle, gasoline, um, and then there is the next one is uh, then Euro 6 diesel and gasoline. So this is the most common one. And now we assign these emission class distribution to vehicle classes, uh, to vehicle types, sorry. Vehicle types, so for car, we have here the default vehicle types. Um, we uh, assign here in special emission class distribution and we select here passenger car. Of course, you can do that also in the list. Emission class distribution. And we assign to HEV. So we take the rigid truck and to bus, we assign coach. So, and that's all what you need to do import this uh, emission glass distribution and assign them to the vehicles. And whenever a vehicle is created and it's a type of uh, car, then uh, by these proportions here of passenger car, uh, randomly one specific um, emission glass is being assigned to the vehicle. So the next step, this is the first step, is just activation the, the evaluation. So here in emissions, activate portion emission and additionally, you need to activate at least one of the results that are links, it's already activated, or we can network performance, which we activate here. And we don't do the other ones now. Um, we just want to have links and uh, we can network performance. So, and just looking that it's not going too long, um, we'll just simulate yeah, 600 seconds. That's fine. Um, simulate it. And um, yeah, I'll, you see now the vehicles coming. And uh, driving, I'll fast forward, and you see at the end of the simulation run, here calculate emissions through Bosch Cloud. Now it's going to send uh, out, it has collected all the trajectories, it's sending um, to the Bosch Cloud, and then after that, uh, receiving them, the emissions. In the meantime, I'll show you if you press F1, which opens the help, uh, the Visim help, um, there, if you search, for emissions. There is this attribute of emission class distribution. Um, I showed you a lot of them, but you see them all here documented, like what is PC, what is LCV. There's a lot of shortcuts, um, the city bus, the euro, what EGR, and so, so you find all that um, documented um, in your um, VISIM installation. Okay. Um, 
this is what you have and it's still calculating um, let's wait a little bit um, while um, I'll show you later the results I'll show you also here you see that it's still calculating um, I also prepared another example model um, so this is a model also an example model which we deliver with Vizim and there we have three uh, scenarios for which we have calculated already emissions so first one is a base scenario and if we look at the base scenario we can um, show um, the, the, the emissions and um, then we have a scenario with uh, where we introduce a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour throughout the entire network so of course very simplified and we have a scenario where we introduce where we bend all engines older than a euro five so the, the ones who have most emissions by the way here emission calculation is being done but let me first show you the scenarios so and we can show them here with scenario comparison okay if we look here at nox yeah the base scenario has this amount of nox if we introduce a scenario with 30 kilometers per hour, um, it will reduce the NOx and with um, Euro 5 and 6 as well. And we can do that for all the others as well for CO2 and actually also compare it in terms of savings, emission savings. So um, if we introduce uh, the 30 kilometers per hour, we'll save um, like 10% of CO2 but for Euro 5 and 6, we'll save 63%. And that relation gives you an indication and you can test different measures to um, deal with uh, air quality. Same for particles and for you know, X there, saving is not that. And you can show that uh, next, right next to um, traffic KPIs. For the, in that, for example, the delay, you see if you introduce a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour, the delay decreases a little bit. You have 13% uh, more stops. Uh, but of course, the other side, you save in emissions and you can do this complete um, evaluation in terms of uh, traffic performance, but also in emissions uh, performance. Here, delay and stops is the same because we just changed the emission glass distribution, the simulation, the vehicles is exactly the same. And visually, you can also, as um, Kamal was showing, you can shape, also show, for example, NOx, the comparison. So um, this is, now let me first show this example. Uh, um, this is the, the, the base scenario. So where are the emissions? Um, and uh, you can also compare it like these are the, the, the savings, the big savings, um, the, the green ones, and also the, where it might get worse um, if you introduce the speed limit of 30. And at the same, you can of course also uh, compare it the NOx versus um, Euro 5 and 6 and where you have the change. So you can visualize it, you can show as Kamal was showing in the Stuttgart study, you can use this to do all that with your example network, play around with some scenario and show it. So finally here in, the, in our example, I'll show you now the emission results. So if we look at links and link evaluation segments, Maybe of this link, and then we have here the emissions. We'll only do average, average, yes, and we will CO, um, C, and X particles, for example, um, add them to the list, and then you see you have here the emissions for each uh, link evaluation segments. Uh, for um, NOx, maximum is 0 0.16 for this link. Maybe for all the links, it is yeah, around 0 0.5. So if we will, if you if we do that, um, of course, we use a color scheme to visualize that segments. Uh, we'll use NOx and less is better, so green, and we reduce the scaling to 0. Oh, sorry, I misclicked. Um, color scheme zero point one light. We'll make it when it's getting very worse. We'll make it black, and then you see here where you have the emissions um, in your network. Yeah. So this is how it uh, works. And as I said before, um, I mean currently we support uh, the 
more or less the EU legislation with Harvey EFA. But the plan is um, that we also support uh, next is the US, US legislation. And when then we'll also add, starting from December, early next year, we'll start also emission class distribution um, in Asia. So vehicle fleet configuration that you have it ready to go. So this is how it works. And we'll be, we'll be key to learn more about also what you think about it. And we'll take the two remaining minutes. And um, I hope you can just fill out this um, questionnaire. Um, I'll post it in the chat. No, I cannot post it in the chat for everyone. Can someone post this link in the chat, ptv.to emissions, or you scan this uh, with your smartphone. And then there are some simple three, five, four, six questions. If you're a visiting user, where are you from? Because we want to know where is the highest demand um, in Asian countries to prioritize um, which uh, legislation, which countries. Um, thank you, Min, for posting the link. Um, that you, um, so in the chat, you'll find the link and we'll be very happy if you can just fill out this quick survey. Um, let's have a look at it. Um, so we'll look live also at the answers. So let's see if some of you have already finished the survey. So five have already finished the survey. So the other questions are if you already did um, use um, emission calculation tools. And uh, there's also two no's um, you think that might be become uh, relevant in the future or not. And then we want to know which kind of emissions um, is most attractive. Is, is it emissions? So this is what you have at, uh, from the vehicle. Um, and the other one is air quality. Like if you set a certain location in your network and you want to um, combine all emissions together and uh, output, uh, how is, does it affect uh, air quality? Then the, the non-exhaust emissions, if that is of relevant, um, share of vehicle emissions of all emissions so that we take, for example, all emissions in the city into account and what is actually the, the share which transportation the vehicles have in this all emissions in the, in the city, include data from air quality boxes so that you can calibrate your model uh, with real world emissions. The dispersion model is something that you visualize where is the air quality in the city and emissions results for individual vehicles. And thank you for the 14 people already finished the survey. I hope we get some more. Most of you are WISM users. Most of you are from Singapore, Philippines. We have four. Thank you very much. South Korea, one. Uh, Indonesia. Jorn. Yeah. You know, there are two questions. Okay, probably I can uh, take get uh, get an additional one minute. Okay, for you and Kamal yeah. to uh, answer. So first question from Nathaniel Tan. Okay, does the ESTM take into account that some vehicles, even buses, might have stop-start technology rather than assuming that they would idle all the time when stopped at the traffic light junctions? You want me to repeat again? Yeah, now I got it. I think it's more a question to Kamal how the emission calculations work on the Bosch side. Can you repeat? So um, I didn't understand it 100%. Yeah, now Kamal, I repeat the question again. Does the ESTM take into account that some vehicles, even buses, might have stop start technology rather than assuming that they would idle all the time when when stop at the traffic light junction if i'm not wrong nathaniel uh, please correct me because some junction they have a bus priority so yes so by sorry yeah continue yes uh, taking into account the velocity of the of the buses we can know if they stopped or not because uh, when they stop uh, they stop also uh, doing the emission is it uh, the question yes well maybe, maybe to add what what i learned is also like um, you consider the the temperature 
of the engine and especially of the catalysator, which is very relevant yes. for emissions. Yeah. So, and uh, during a start stop, I mean, then of course you, you don't have acceleration, you stand, and uh, this might lead to a reduction in the temperature of the catalysator. Well, the engine is still running. Um, so, I think that is all considered in your model. Um, if it's longer standing, if engine is off and on, but we don't send that information if that is a start stop vehicle or if it's not. So, this is something Vision cannot have. So, we can't send this information about start stop. To you, if the engine is off while standing or the engine is on while standing. That's all it was. Yeah. So I think the answer actually, when you use Visim, um, it's not you cannot consider the start stop. Yeah, but Bosch on Bosch side, it um, it has an influence if the engine is off and on. And by the way, um, two rec uh, two side remarks. I said this temperature of the catalysator is very important and this is to consider. Um, we only delete basically the, the engine temperature if a vehicle is parking, um, not at a bus, a bus stop, then the temperature will remain high. Uh, but if a vehicle parks, even for five seconds, we start a new trajectory. And if a new trajectory is being started, the, the starting temperature is zero of the catalysator, leading to higher emissions. So you might need to add a warm-up period for these vehicles so that the engine is hot when they run into the simulation and then leading to uh, more realistic emissions. Because that's because some some cars they have, they have this like uh, stop start technology. So when they're sitting idle yeah. they the engine stop then you know when they move then the engine restart again. So yeah. then then uh, quickly second question uh, disaggregated result from a different vehicle classes generated. The question from Ki Jun Kim. Now, currently, we don't support disaggregated uh, results, but that's a potential development in the future. That's also why we did this questionnaire. So this is the starting of the partnership between PDV and Bosch, and that's why we ask you the uh, the relevance of the different topics for further development, and uh, that could be. Uh, the emission results for individual vehicles. Okay. No, that's all. Uh, the... classes, sorry, one more. Weaker classes is supported. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, so if you define different weaker classes, you get um, the emissions by uh, for buses, for HGVs, for cars at certain location, as with all the other results. Sorry, that is possible, but only very individual of each of single vehicles. That's not possible, except if you create a vehicle class for each single vehicle, then you would get also single vehicle. Uh, okay. Okay. Johan, uh, we already uh, exceeded four minutes. So again, thanks a lot, Johan Kama, for this informative uh, presentation. Yep. Which, you know, one, should one final, can I have one Sorry. final remark? Just uh, if you want to test it, uh, please contact uh, your local team in Singapore. Here is a contact form, free testing. We're happy to provide you free, free temporary licenses to test it. So we're very happy to hear also your feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kamal. So we move to the next, the final presentation. Now, the topic is strategic planning for e buses. Going to be presented by Sebastian Silman. Our colleague is a wisdom guru. <laughs> wisdom guru. And that, uh, about Sebastian, Sebastian studied in civil engineering with a focus in transportation science in Hanover, Germany. After working for a local consulting company, he joined PTV Group in uh, 2005. He has the consulting background plus the, the software uh, development background. So he worked for public transport consulting, conducting cost benefit analysis for national project. Today, he is at PTV as a product manager for the macroscopic modeling tool, PTV Vision. So I don't want to uh, waste my time. Uh, just go to the topic. Sebastian, feel free to present. Okay, thank you, Gobi. 
Uh, yeah, I would like to talk about uh, strategic planning for e-buses today and how PTV Visum can help you with uh, this task. Um, starting the presentation here. Okay, uh, there's new legislation in place in the EU called the Clean Vehicle Directive, and uh, this defines uh, what a clean vehicle is, how it is uh, powered and fueled. And uh, it gives minimum quotas to all operators um, uh, what their fleet should look like uh, today and in 2026. And yeah, same is true for your uh, region in Singapore. There was uh, uh, revealed that the parliament uh, want to put out of order all the diesel buses uh, for 2040 and replace them by clean energy um, buses, uh, so most likely battery electric or hydrogen. And um, yeah, so uh, the amount of electric buses raises, uh, uh, increases all over the world. Um, uh, but uh, those buses come with two major drawbacks. Uh, the range of a battery bus is much smaller than a diesel bus, and so um, and uh, yeah, fueling takes longer, way longer than uh, fueling with with um, uh, gasoline, uh, or it has to be done more frequently. But how bad are those drawbacks really? Um, this is um, a diagram showing you the uh, charging hours, the battery size, the charging power you can use, and the available energy. So, for an example, if you charge um, a bus with about three hour, for about three hours uh, with uh, 50 kilowatt um, charging power, then you will receive about 120 kilowatt hours uh, for driving. Uh, and if you uh, consume about 2.5 kilowatt hours uh, of energy per kilometer, yeah, it will give you about 50 kilometers um, of range for your bus. So it is 50 kilometers of range for three hours of uh, charging, this would be bad, but there's other examples where you can charge um, with 300 kilowatts and then you have more energy available and with the same uh, consumption, you can last about 150 uh, kilometers. So you may ask why not only change or charge your buses with uh, more uh, charging power? Yeah, then this axis come into place the battery cost, batteries which can um, take those charging powers are very expensive and you have to protect your investment. So you have to protect your batteries. The battery is about 50% of the vehicle cost then and you have to protect your battery for battery fading. And this battery fading have uh, several um, uh, influences and one of the most uh, important one is a um, is a C rate. The C rate uh, gives you an, uh, an indicator about the possible charging power in uh, relation to your uh, battery capacity. And this means that slower charging is always better for the battery, and higher capacity batteries um, means they are able to uh, um, cope with fast charging. Um, one other thing is, and that's true for your mobile cell phone as well, nothing brings your battery faster to an end if you um, discharge it to 0% and then fully charge it again. So the charging stroke is much more important for um, battery fading than the amount of charging activity. So it is better to charge often, but not such a high stroke. Uh, then having it uh, less frequently with higher strokes. Uh, and of course, it's always good to have a temperature management, so warming up or cooling down the batteries before charging or while charging. So the battery size is something you have really to consider and 
that um, we have to find the ways how to um, or the goals we want to attain here. Uh, of course, we want to have the maximum energy efficiency out of it. So we want to have uh, have much uh, the most kilometers out of our kilowatt hours in the battery. Uh, we want, of course, to minimize our battery capacity because they are uh, cheaper. Uh, we want to have the maximum state of health for our battery. We want to minimize the number of charging points because this is the number uh, to minimize the amount of money for our infrastructure investment. And uh, of course, we want to maximize the charging power, uh, not to have empty time in our bus. And if you put this into a graph um, and test it against a high capacity battery, you see, okay, we can, char we can charge them with a high power. We can minimize the number of charging points. It's good for uh, having a, a high capacity battery uh, for the state of health. We have, of course, very expensive um, uh, batteries then in operation. And yeah, the maximum energy efficiency is not as uh, good because those heavy, uh, this high capacity batteries, they are very heavy. They have a lot of mass. You have to accelerate and decelerate every time in your bus. So the energy efficiency is not as high as in um, low capacity uh, batteries. These are much cheaper. We have to consider always the state of health with them. We have, of course, a higher number of charging points, have to have a higher number of charging points in our infrastructure. And uh, of course, um, we have to take care about the charging power we uh, provide to those batteries. Unfortunately, there is no one size fits all problems with battery sizes here. So you have to consider your network and your uh, charging strategy to your battery size. And talking about charging uh, strategies, there are three uh, main strategies in place. Um, one is the uh, overnight charging, where the charging is centralized in a depot. There, of course, because it's overnight, slow charging is possible, which is good for your battery. Um, and But you can use then, or you have to use high capacity batteries there, and the bus range is up to 250 kilometers. One example here is Paris, and they are bound to this because they are not allowed to do additional infrastructure outside the depot because of protecting the historical and cultural heritage. And as well as true for uh, Singapore, uh, this was the new Singapore buses. Um, and here you see the uh, charging infrastructure in the depot as well. Another strategy is the opportunity charging. It is decentralized uh, charging then uh, using fast chargers, and then you just need smaller uh, batteries. Um, and one example is the Amsterdam ski pole, which is the airport in Amsterdam. Uh, they are operating about 100 buses. They're using 450 kilowatt chargers. This means they are recharged in 12 minutes, which is good for a layover then. And one bus is operating about 500 kilometers per day, 24 seven. The same technology is in place in Singapore um, right now. So, they are also charging at the endpoints, so um, decent light uh, charging. And here's a picture of the Singapore uh, infrastructure for this. Uh, one a little bit more exotic one is the in motion charging. Here, a picture from Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, they operate trolley buses, and now this is a new one. Um, for um, uh, buses who have as well not only the catenary uh, uh, over them, but as well a small battery in them. So they can leave the catenary here and run on uh, battery uh, the time where no catenary is available. And for Zurich, this is perfect uh, because then they have more flexible uh, operation and no extra infrastructure because they already have this catenary. Um, 
So yeah, um, maybe to sum this up, uh, transfer, uh, transferring to electric buses is more than buying a new vehicle. And yeah, if you talk to customers, the common first approach is, yeah, we just fuel the uh, buses differently. Now we are losing, uh, using electric energy. Uh, we will charge them overnight by batteries, which last the whole day and equip the depot with sufficient energy. And yeah, that's that's one solution, but there's more to evaluate. You have really to rethink your system if you introduce um, uh, battery electric buses. And uh, these are the questions the operator has to, to answer. Of course, you have to, uh, to think about what uh, system he wants to implement, uh, what kind of vehicle, what about the range, the capacity then, how many vehicles do they do they need? Because if the range is smaller than in diesels, you might need more vehicles then. Um, you have to uh, decide about charging sites uh, and charging infrastructure, and maybe as well for your uh, network design. Okay, and how does PTV Visum plays a role into it? PTV Visum is all about traffic modeling. And if you talk about traffic modeling, you first think about, okay, combining a public transport supply, so the, um, the timetable and the demand, and you bring in the traffic assignments, calculate journey times, transfers, fares, comfort, and so on. And so you have the user perspective on, on this. And of course, you can calculate more choice and everything like this. You know this for PTV Visum. But there's another uh, side to this. Um, it's uh, one major um, uh, algorithm in here. It's line blocking, or maybe you know it as vehicle scheduling. But, uh, it, it depends a little bit on the region of world you uh, you are in. Um, then uh, this line blocking gives you the vehicle requirements operating this timetable. It gives you the uh, empty mileage uh, and the service mileage and so on. And it gives you the costs for the operator. And of course, it gives you the en energy need and maybe as well as the pollution. Okay, and this line blocking or vehicle scheduling, how does it work? It converts a timetable into vehicle tours. So for a small example, we have here four uh, stops and we have here the time uh, scale and we have a red line operating between one and stop one and two and a blue line operating between three and four. And now the vehicle uh, scheduling tries to combine this. And there's one possibility to have here two vehicles in operation with uh, long layovers. And the other one, the same, uh, with the same uh, base information here, timetable, uh, you can as well use this as a, um, a vehicle schedule that it's operating with one run, uh, with one vehicle, but with two extra empty runs uh, transferring from this stop to this stop. So now it's to, to decide which uh, vehicle schedule would be better. And this is you're doing by minimizing the costs. And the cost uh, is derived out of uh, uh, attributes for, or for costs for empty trips, for all of the activities, for service trips, layovers, and so on. And then you can decide what uh, the actual best vehicle schedule for your um, timetable. And what we've done uh, last year, we uh, add a battery electric operation to this. This means we um, put in uh, attributes in the network for the energy consumption model, for a recharging model, uh, of course, for vehicle specifications like battery capacities and costs, and uh, the charging infrastructure, of course, uh, about charging powers location and of the amount of um, charging infrastructure in place. A small example for um, within PTV Visum. So you have three lines here, a yellow one, a purple one, and a green one. And uh, for this, you do not need too much data to, um, uh, to do a line blocking. And this looks like this. These are results for a diesel bus. Uh, what you see here is our line block editor. Every row in here, um, it's one bus uh, here color coded 
for the line operating in this. So the, the uh, colorful boxes in here are the service trips. The light yellow one is the depot time. And in summary, you see you need 16 um, vehicles. You are operating about 140 hours. The empty trip time uh, is five hours and uh, maybe 120 kilometers. And of course, for diesel buses, you do not need charging activities. Uh, now testing this with uh, overnight charging. So you have one centralized um, charging infrastructure in your system. Um, you can uh, do this vehicle, uh, vehicle scheduling as well. Now the service trips are not color coded by line, but uh, but by the state of charge of your battery. Means green is a full battery, purple is a very um, empty battery um, and you see in here the charging activities you see now you need 19 vehicles so three vehicles more because of the limited range you see your empty mileage is going up from 120 to about 600 so it's five times more and you have about 46 uh, um, charging activities and you see here in a scenario like this yeah your battery capacity is not sufficient so you have just an overnight charging but you have to have charging activities during the day as well so in this case you see okay you need to improve your battery capacity um, opportunity charging um, means uh, yeah you have now the charging infrastructures at one in, um, end point of your line um, and uh, this looks then different Then your number of vehicles are back to 16. We need no extra uh, vehicles for this. Your empty mileage is going down to 100, but you have, of course, a lot more charging activities. But keep in mind what I've told before, the amount of charging activities is not as important as the stroke uh, of the uh, charging. Uh, so this mean it looks like it looks better than the uh, previous scenario, and of course here for completeness uh, uh, in motion charging you have catenary just on this street here where the vehicles are charging, and you see okay um, you also going down to 16 vehicles here uh, you have uh, 17 extra. Um, uh, charging activities where the uh, buses uh, go back to uh, the uh, depot and your empty mileage is about 200 about this. So this means, yeah, this could be a nice way, but you have maybe two less catenary in this example and or you have to increase the charging power. Okay, having all this data and more data available like the average uh, charging, so the state of, gives you the state of health, uh, CO2 consumption, the total cost, you can um, actually um, calculate the total cost of ownership. Means uh, not only the capital cost, operating cost, infrastructure cost, but as well the, like the climate external cost or the health external costs. And if you calculate this, you see even with the prices today for battery and those buses, you are cheaper if you really um, I uh, think of your total cost of ownership, including those health and climate external costs. Okay, and with this, I can sum all up. So yeah, all operators around the world have to consider clean vehicles in their fleet. Um, and introducing such vehicles, it's far more than fueling the vehicles differently. Um, it's introducing really a new uh, system and yeah, for, for planning this, there's no much extra data and time required. You can simulate those scenarios with PTV Visum, and uh, Visum is uh, offering a reliable uh, base for tonal cost of ownership calculations. And if you want to see how it is done step by step in uh, Visum, we published an example. And like all our examples, you can reach this within our software, open example dialog uh, direct, and you get um, about nine pages of really doing this in your system. Okay, with this, I'm at the end of my presentations and happy to answer your questions. 
Thank you, Sebastian, for your presentation. I'm quite sure our participants were interested in, uh, who has interest in public transport planning. They'll explore more on the topic. So I have two questions for you, one for Jeff Jeffrey Ang and another one from Daniel Tan. Okay, the first one, can Vizum help to simulate battery swapping instead of battery charging? The last part uh, for, for battery charging then for? Simulate battery swapping instead of battery charging. Ah, battery instead swapping. Of... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, if you do, if you swap the battery, then battery, um, the range is not uh, important, but uh, because you uh, um, provide a full battery, then it's just a way of how long does it take to swap the battery. And this means uh, what's the minimum uh, time of layovers. So this is just another sh charging, um, charging, um, uh, another charging activities, which have a constant time. And of course you can do this. So our other uh, charging activities would be linear. As long as you do the charging, uh, it, you will have more uh, fuel. With battery swapping, it's much easier for, for modeling because you have a constant time and you have a full battery um, instantly. Yeah. So yes, Can I go possible. for the second question? So the second question from Nathaniel Tan, are the different type of charging, like direct charging, off-board, uh, off-charge, on-board charging, something like trolley buses, where the pantograph is on the bus? The different power rating as well as the consumption, consider in Visu? Yeah, um, we, there's something also you, you can look it up how it is done in this example. I also put this in, but uh, for to make it short, uh, all our consumption consumption model and the charging model is um, there is a, a, a default uh, formula for this, so a default graph for this. But the user is also able to uh, manipulate this, so they can. Um, have different charging uh, infrastructure types, fast charger, um, uh, battery swapping, bed, uh, or pantographs going uh, from the bus or at the bus, and the different charging powers uh, as well, giving the amount of time setting those things up, and of course the charging power of how long it does it, how long it takes. So all of these are configurable in Visum. It depends a little bit on how much data is available because we are here on strategic uh, planning means it might be that you're in the beginning phase, the planning phase for this, and you do not know all of those details beforehand. So we try to do this um, uh, flexible. Uh, you can put more uh, data in as uh, uh, Yes, you have more data available in your planning phase. So the third question, uh, Sebastian, is it necessary for interested bus operator to convert into all electric buses for zero uh, emission? Hopefully, most bus operator will cooperate and collaborate with the battery manufacturer for some sort of long lasting plan. So this is, um, Again, this is more of a general question rather rather than a wisdom question. Uh, you mean, do they have to convert to uh, all the buses, all the bu bu buses uh, to, to electric vehicles? Uh, mm -hmm. I think in the end, uh, they have to, uh, in, in EU, EU, I can just talk for the EU right now, they are minimum quotas to have clean vehicles. And clean vehicles means uh, uh, ultra low emissions locally, which means, uh, yeah, battery electric is true for this, but hydrogen is as well uh, possible or um, um, other uh, other energy modes are possible there. And the operator have to decide what um, 
what kind of uh, combustion or uh, energies they are needing. Our tool here is helping you for the most uh, famous one today, maybe not tomorrow, or I don't know how what hydrogen is going up to. Um, for battery electric buses, we are providing those uh, planning tools right now. Let us know if there's anything missing for hydrogen or something else. Uh, yeah, we are very interesting in from from hearing your uh, of your region, what's the, really the need of it? All projects we are done a little bit based on uh, EU right now because it is a high pressure on the EU operator for this. But we are very interesting in hearing what your region is doing in this perspective. Yeah. Last question from my side, Sebastian. Okay. Is it possible? Is it like uh, possible from your side uh, when, to share some use cases or uh, case study hmm. for the EV bus planning using Visum? Um, I can give you some insights into this. We can. Uh, there is one major project in uh, Zurich. The one I showed you, they do uh, projected uh, fleet sizes. So they, they really looked up how many vehicles they need for small size buses. Uh, and the region of Munich, they've done a huge project for line bundling. So preparing uh, uh, operation tender for more about 300 uh, bus lines. Um, so this was a major project, but it was not done by PDV. So we are supporting those people, but uh, it's not our project, so I can't give you the, uh, the reference. But if you get in contact with me, I can uh, or detour you to or uh, forward you to the um, to the companies who did this. And that's all. That's all for for now. I think, uh, Sebastian. Thanks again. You know. Welcome. Participate in our UGM in the AP region and looking forward for more interesting topic next year. So now I pass it over to my colleague Kelvin to conclude the session. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Thank you so much, Gobi. Uh, Sebastian is our last speaker, but definitely not the least. And we want to thank our entire audience and participants for joining us for the all of today. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to cover all the questions, but don't worry, we have it on record. Uh, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to email us. We'll definitely reply you via email and offline. At the end of this event, we'll also have a recording of the session, and my colleagues will share the hyperlink with you very soon after. And please feel free to rewatch it uh, if you've missed any portions of it, and definitely don't hesitate again to contact us if you have any questions. Uh, finally, uh, PTV is actually co-organizing another event with ITS Singapore on 9th of December. Uh, we will send out an email and an invite for everybody to join us. So please keep an eye out for more details. Finally, from the entire team at PTV and myself, we really want to thank you for joining us this post of today. We hope you enjoyed this first of many hybrid online uh, events and UGMs in the future. And finally, we want to say thank you, stay safe, be well, and take care. Thank you so much from all of us in Singapore and PTV to all of you. Be safe.